I welcome members who are participating by video conferencing today to uh, allow us to maintain the social distancing regulations. And I would like to remind all members about the protocols regarding um, use of electronic devices. And our members online this morning are Pat Sheehan and Colin McGrath. Okay. We'd, we'd, Colin. Sorry, Colin hasn't joined yet. Yes, Colin hasn't joined yet, but we are expecting Colin to join by by uh, phone, and I let you know when he joins there, if I can, if I spot it. So um, there has been no apologies received for this morning's meeting, and in terms of chairperson's business, I spoke in a number of debates in the chamber on coronavirus statutory regulations, the Craigavon coronavirus outbreak, and a number of uh, interviews. Um, moving on to the draft minutes there, item three, I refer members to... Sorry, if I could just uh, come in on the, uh, on the chairman's business bit. Yes. Um, I, I, I know that you did an interview last weekend on, on Sunday politics. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, is, is, is any guidance given to uh, chairman as to the high to deal with interviews like that? It must be very difficult... Um, you know, to stray into your own personal views, maybe when you're when you've been portrayed as being the spokesman of the committee. And just I noticed last Sunday there were just a couple of issues where uh, things that the committee hadn't really discussed, but you were being asked questions about it and you were answering questions, and it came across that you were answering on behalf of the committee, that you were mandated by the committee and that the committee had discussed it. So it, it is, I, I understand the dilemma, it, it must be difficult when you're put in that, you know, in, in, in that position, but would you agree that there is a difficulty sometimes with that type of interview? Yeah, uh, certainly, and I see that Colin has joined us just to note that. Um, there is that difficulty, and indeed um, I have asked the, the communications department here to make it clear that when interviewers seek to interview as chair of the health committee that they, they, they abide by that, and I, I would at times seek to differentiate where I have to, um, but when a question is put to you, sometimes there can be that issue. So I acknowledge that that certainly can be an issue, and uh, I always seek to represent the committee's views fairly and, and, no, I understand and, that, and yeah. openly in that, in that respect. Yep. So, thank you. Um, moving on then to the draft minutes, I refer members to the minutes uh, the, at tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members content, thank you. There are two matters arising. Um, members will remember that the committee agreed last week to request a copy of the safeguarding report of the independent review by CPEA into the failings around Dunmorey Manor Care Home. I can advise members that this report has been published on the department's website. Um, are members content to note for the present, for, for present pending future consideration of adult safeguarding and care homes? Yeah. Thank you. Secondly, members, can I confirm that the letter to stakeholders in relation to our inquiries was agreed by email, and thank you to all members for your cooperation in responding to that. Moving now this morning, members, to correspondence, can I refer you to your correspondence tab at, at tab 5 of the pack and table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 5.1? So I'd like to draw members' attention to a number of items there. Um, item 5.4 is from the Minister of Health and the Minister for Justice regarding a proposed consultation on the development of a regional care and justice campus for children and young people. The ministers advise that their intention is to respond more effectively and consistently to the complex needs of this uh, vulnerable cohort of children. So have members anything in relation to that item they want to note or say? Are we going to get a, a briefing down the line on this? Well, there will be a consultation, um, and uh, what, what I was going to suggest maybe we request a written summary of the consultation responses and consider then what our further engagement okay. might be. Yep. But I do think it is, it is a key issue, and I think we certainly have, as a committee, identified our, uh, our priority in, in relation to safeguarding vulnerable groups, and those, those particularly vulnerable children, I think, would be that. So I, I think we will be certainly looking to engage further. On that, so are members content with that? Excellent, thank you. Item 5.5 .5, then is a departmental response to the committee's correspondence regarding regional disparities in the delivery of maternity services during the pandemic and revised guidance on visiting uh, rights. So, uh, 
I do note that there has been additional guidance published last night. I haven't had a chance, I have to say, to look at it in detail, but I do welcome the fact that there is at least an attempt to try to address some of those issues. Uh, I'm not sure, as, as a lot of these things are, the devil will be possibly in the detail, but Paula? Um, I'm sure all the MLAs will have received a lot of very, very distressing emails from um, constituents over the last week. Um, from fathers and, and people who pregnant mothers, who are pregnant women who um, have been suffering from great anxiety and depression during their um, pregnancy and are so petrified of not having the support. The other side of that is that because the, the birthing partners are not able to, to stay around, then if women have had like a cesarean or a very complicated um, birth, then the, the midwives and the people on the ward are actually then having to help change nappies and, and provide additional support. So there there are consequences from these gui this guidance coming in, and I'm just wondering, is this something we as a committee can look further at? Because I understand the rationale, but the unintended consequences in terms of the women's mental health, we at this committee have talked about perinatal mental health many times, it's a big concern to us, but also then the impact on the, the health workers in, in the maternity wards. I, I think that there's this needs further um, information as to how they came to this decision. Yeah, any other? Views from members, Pam. Yeah, I would, I would concur with uh, Paula's um, thoughts there. And we know, obviously, um, uh, Naomi Long has written to the executive to, to ask, um, basically, that that element um, be relaxed. Um, I, I, you know, we, we all understand why the restrictions are there, but I would agree. I mean, every um, pregnancy. Um, you know, is, is different, and, and there will be many different needs physically and, and mentally around that. So, it, it's a very difficult one. I, I would like us to, if we, if there's a role for the committee to actually look further at this, or to, you know, to speak to the minister about it, or, or indeed the trust, or Charlie McArdle, whoever would be most appropriate. I think, um, you know, whatever efforts can be made to to try and do this, because it, we we know when. Uh, you know, a scenario where we could be looking at a very long term implications for maternity services and for a partners being able to accompany their, um, you know, okay. in, in maternity appointment. So I think it is important that we that we do look at it further if we can. Yeah. Colin has indicated there. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And um, I think it is something that we should get some sort of briefing on because I think special arrangements can be made. Maternity hospitals are often quite separate buildings from other hospital services. I mean, many constituents, uh, constituents are contacting us really frightened and scared that they're going to go through um, the, 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 the sort of the birthing process and not have that um, support from start to finish. And I think that the guidelines even suggest that week of a visit but many mothers are, are only in the hospital for a matter of days but for them those days may feel like a long period of time if they can't have the support of of the father or, or somebody else with them to be able to help them so i think we should get somebody in to give us a, a, the rationale for it and also to see if there are ways that we can work around it because i'm sure there, there's always a way to work around these things to to be able to provide support yeah, thank you alex yeah, I've had quite a few complaints about this, so, you know, I do think there has to be ways around this. So I think it's really important that a father's there for the mother, you know, whether it's a scan or an antenatal appointment or, or the birthing thing. So um, I'd be keen to try and find a solution to this, if we can. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I also have been approached by numerous numerous people, similar to members have reported, and also the issue of postnatal care and uh, and access to GP appointments and follow up care, where it's vital that both both partners are able to participate and support each other, and through through what can be difficult times as well as joyful times. So I do think it is an issue of significant concern for the committee. I'm conscious the minister is is uh, proposing to be here. Uh, and we could raise it. We could raise it there if members are content, and we can then consider how we might then uh, do further work on, on it. Uh, would members be content with that? Yeah, I, think Alan. Chair, I think, Chairman, what we have to be conscious of as well. I'm very sympathetic with the, uh, the, the, the complaints that we're, we're getting about uh, birthing and, and, and people going for scans and so forth. 
I think also, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that uh, this virus has got into a couple of our hospitals and has caused absolute havoc and death. Um, so it, it would be interesting. I think we do need to know what is the scientific and medical um, rationale behind it, um, because it might be irresponsible to, you know, to start advocating um, relaxing um, regulations which have good scientific evidence behind them, um, given that there is, you know, we're also conscious of what's happening in the hospitals with the virus getting into that setting, you know, so it's, it's yeah. I think we need to, we need all the, the information and uh, it would be good to get some sort of a presentation about it. Um, so, well, maybe we should flag as well to the department that that we would like a, a more fuller a more fuller briefing on that. And I think all members would agree, Alan, that none of us would advocate anything that would in any way create or present a danger to staff or patients or anyone. But um, I suppose what we're what we're trying to achieve is are there ways of doing this in a way that's safe and supportive? And, and I think that will be. Okay, well, so we, we will get an opportunity to raise it with the minister, and we will ask for a more a more fuller uh, briefing and engagement on that important issue. All right, members, content. Thank you. Moving on to item 5.10 is from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health regarding its engagement with the department on shielding guidance for children and young people. Um, another significant issue. Have members any comments or suggestions in relation to that? I, I was thinking maybe if we forwarded the item to the Minister and request an update in relation to that situation to see can we get a, a handle on, on what's members content. Thank you. Item 5.17 is from the Committee on Procedures regarding the temporary provisions within standing orders 110 to 116. While their extension to the end of January will be debated in the Chamber next week, the Committee is also reviewing the provisions and is seeking views by the 23rd of October. So do members have views on that that they want to share or are content for the for to debate in the chamber? Yeah. So content to indicate that we don't want to propose any amendments to the temporary standing orders for the moment. Would members be content with that? Thank you. Um, are members then content with the remaining actions outlined in the correspondence list at tab 5.1? Jerry? Sure, I got a comment on two quick uh, items if I can. Um, 5.12. Um, I sent around a, a link to a petition um, from Emer Smith, uh, a, a young woman who passed away four years ago uh, in my constituency. Around um, uh, the petition is to promote stem cell donation. Um, I think it would be so if people can, can sign and share that in their own time. Um, and also just uh, 5.13. Um, uh, just a second, Jerry. Members, members on the phone, could you maybe mute when you're uh, when you're off? We're getting feedback from some from some one of you. I think it's from yourselves, or there's people in, in maybe in the waiting room. If everyone can ensure that they're that they're muted, there's a wee bit of feedback coming into the room. Sorry for interrupting. Sure. Um, five point so it was one three and uh, five point one six. The neurology um, uh, review. Just there's, there's been quite a few people in touch with myself probably others as well this week, uh, who obviously are, are very upset with the experience that they've went through, but when they're just seeing information leaked out in the newspapers, it's causing a lot of trauma, uh, a lot of tears, a lot of anxiety and stress. So um, I told them I would convey that um, to the department and the minister as much as I can, but I think it's, it's useful for, for, for members of the committee to, to know that. They obviously have been through a traumatic ex experience already, and when they uh, receive up updates through leaks or through the media, uh, that is very concerning for them. So I think we, if we can emphasise that uh, there needs to be some conveying to them of, of, of what's happening through this process, I think it would make things a lot, lot easier for them uh, at this time. But I just wanted to, to raise that as well. Thanks. Pardon, sir? Sorry, is there a proposal there, Chair? Um, I think we'll, we've got a. The Brett Lockhart is due to come in this, uh, in a few weeks' time, I think. So, um, just if, if we have any correspondence with the department uh, in the time um, in between, then that we can just relay that people are um, quite concerned about the way information is being leaked out, and that the department has a duty of care to them. Um, I don't know if that needs to be in a letter, um, Chair, to be frank, but I think if we can convey that general point of the department, I think it would be very, very useful. 
Yeah, members content. Alan? Chair, just uh, yeah. Chair, uh, I've Alan first, Pat, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Jerry, it's just yeah, reference or that Brett Lockhart is, is coming in to address the committee. Um, what is what's his brief for what he's going to brief us on? Um, Clerk, how have we framed that? <coughs> the, the committee had agreed to write and request an update on, on the progress of the inquiry. I think we'd been given to understand previously that. That's likely to be confined to uh, process largely, um, given the sensitivity of the of the matters at hand. You, you know, you'll, members will understand uh, an inquiry chairperson wouldn't be able to go into huge detail about what they've heard or wh where their conclusions are going. Obviously, so it would be largely process we'd expect. Um, at around about the same time that the committee agreed to write back and try to reconfirm that briefing, which had been cancelled due to COVID. Um, at the same time, the, uh, the inquiry itself wrote to the committee and offered a briefing. So we're looking at a date of the 12th of November at this point. Yeah. Uh, Pat? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I just wanted to come in on this issue as well. And just uh, to put some context to it, previously when the Assembly was down, the independent inquiry uh, the two co-chairs, Brad Lockhart and Hugo Massey-Taylor, gave fairly regular briefings to MLAs. However, when the Assembly was uh, back up and running again, uh, we were told that the responsibility of the inquiry was to report directly to the Minister and the Department. Uh, and Previously, we were able to feed back to former patients of Dr Watt who had contacted us about progress in the inquiry uh, and the process as well. Uh, and many of the uh, patients that I have spoken to are unhappy now about the lack of transparency that appears to be in the process. And that's uh, exemplified by the fact that that story appeared in the Irish News last week saying that uh, Michael Watt is no longer an employee of the Belfast Trust. Uh, that may have uh, implications in terms of the authority that the GMC may have over him in terms of any disciplinary inquiries or investigations. So the, the former patients who have been harmed in all of this uh, are facing great uncertainty. They don't know what's happening. There's no briefing coming from the department that I can see. And I, I, I mean, I would have hoped that Brad Lockhart could have appeared before November. Uh, I think, I think uh, there, there's a, a requirement for some urgency in this now. And there's speculation that this inquiry may actually continue for another year. Now, some of us uh, were unhappy with the nature of this inquiry in the first place, that given the numbers of people who have been harmed in this particular scandal, uh, a full-blown public inquiry uh, was necessary to get to the truth. And, th and the fact we now know that Michael Watt is refusing to appear in front of this inquiry uh, would suggest that levels of accountability that are required uh, as an outcome in this aren't going to happen. So, uh, I mean, I suppose I'm just voicing concerns that patients, the former patients of what have raised with me. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And Paula? Um, thank you, Chair. And I would very much concur with what Pat has just outlined there. Um, it was the health spokespersons at the time, and I, I appreciate that some of them have changed for the main parties now. But, you know, it was very clear in terms of our respect for the, the co-chairs and their ability. But like we have seen with the RQIA um, review and, and others recently, you know, the terms of reference set for this inquisitorial inquiry were so tightly defined that I don't think that we were ever going to get to the nub of, of what actually went wrong and the extent to which other people within that, um, that trust at the time were responsible for, for the errors. So I would very much um, support what Pat has said there. I wrote to the Minister when we had the um, devolution, uh, when the Assembly um, came back up and running and asked where it was uh, there the potential for it to move from an inquisitorial inquiry into a full public inquiry. 
and I was advised at the time that that was not thought the case. But I'm very concerned about the lack of transparency at this stage, and obviously now that we know that um, Dr Watt is no longer under the employment of, of the trust, that I, I'm not sure that we are going to get to the full extent of what actually happened in this and other health scandals. So I think that the urgency of, of bringing him forward, and if it has to be in closed session, I am comfortable with that because I think we have the mandate and the support of those um, patients who have come to us privately and shared their very personal and distressing stories, but we do need, we do need them to come as soon as possible. Thank you. Um. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and I also want to concur with Pat's comments and Paula's. Uh, and I wasn't a, a health spokesperson at, in, in that time period, so I don't have the benefit of, of um, but the briefings were, but were available back then. But it seems quite bizarre that while the Assembly wasn't sitting, there was more information available to members and then in turn to families concerned. So um, I just want to speak up in support of, of the comments that have been made here today that really been we need more information, uh, and families need more information. I mean, when you're, when you're ex expecting a result and something to happen, that could, that's you know uh, greatly increases that the amount of anxiety in terms of time. If you don't even have a general time frame or period, and you're not getting very basic information, even uh, disseminated, that is that is very distressing. So I think we do need uh, to take some action on this. Um, so I would support that. Thank you. And yeah, finally, Chair, sure, thank you. Uh, like Pam, I, I came to this topic late, so uh, you know it's it's catch up. Um, but can I ask, is there um, have the PSNI any involvement in this at the present time, or is there any likelihood that at some stage there could be PSI in, uh, involvement? I'm not aware at this point in time if there if there's PSNI involvement. So, sure, I can I come in on that point? Yeah, we'll go ahead and then have Colin. Yes, go ahead, Pat. Just, just, just an answer to Alan's question. My understanding is that the PSNI are investigating uh, the, the possibility of criminal actions uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, and, and, and just another point I forgot to make. I mean, the Belfast Trust came forward with 30,000 pages of evidence within the past couple of weeks. It seems a bit late in the game to be bringing forward that amount of evidence. I'm, I'm wondering what the delay was in that, and maybe the minister might be able to provide us with answers to that question. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. And um, uh, Colin? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to agree with everything that's been said, and especially the bit that um, Pat has raised there, you know, about it being a bit late in the game. I think people are looking answers, and they don't have a great deal of faith in a system that has taken so long um, to try and provide information. They were getting some information from ourselves during the process that has now stopped. And it seems to them like just there's a wall of silence. And I think it's time that we broke through that wall of silence. And if we can have somebody along to the committee, I, I agree, I think November is far away. Um, and somebody even from the department that can give us an update as to what is happening. We need to be able to provide that information um, to the, the hundreds of people out there that were impacted and to those that are contacting us on a regular basis looking updates. Yeah, thank you. And I have to say, I have met with, with families in relation to this in prior to the Assembly, being, and, and it is quite harrowing. And also, I would have a concern that there are potentially further cohorts here which need to be looked at and that, that the delay in, in relation to those is, is having a, a worrying, maybe not on of impact. So um, could we could we then, uh, Clark, could we uh, write and ask for that briefing to be brought forward and also flag up the points that have been discussed in relation to families finding things out through the media and um, ask them can they review and come to us uh, sooner than they have, they have indicated? Um, certainly. I think it was our suggestion that because of our inquiry deadlines and our full agenda between now and then. So I'll come back to the committee about what they would like to defer or... Uh, how, yes, I'd manage that. I'll, we're we're going to have, to, we're going to, have to, to figure out, and I think that's an important point to make. In fairness, that that, that was our that, that was that was our suggestion. But uh, there is, I think, an urgency, so we will have to look at how we we uh, rejig the very substantial work that we have in front of us to to accommodate that. But I think it is appropriate. Okay, okay, members, thank you for that. Um, in relation to uh, one of the issues there that have been mentioned. Previously, in the uh, Emer's wish that um, 
uh, that that I, and I have spoken with uh, and learnt learnt in in recent times that actually our cancer provision for young people is very very inadequate and doesn't meet their needs very well. And I think that's an issue as well as this petition. I think it's an issue that we will want to try to get in some of those what I've what I've raised earlier. You know that those more uh, extensive outreach to some of the people who have good experience of, of how these things can impact on their lives and I think it's important that we try to, to we try to find a way to accommodate those. Yeah, there's also uh, the father's produced a special gin which I'm told is quite tasty so you might uh, be able to present that maybe to <laughs> yourself or something. Well, well, that's, that's, I can't say that for certain but he might. That's certainly that's certainly a new a new angle certainly yeah, on, on that. Okay thank you members. Um, so moving on then to Item 5.19 is from the Minister regarding the provision of extra places for medical students at Queen's University. Um, and I think that would be something that we would uh, largely welcome, in, given the pressure that there are on recruitment in health and social care. And item 5.21 is the 21st report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. So are members content to note both those items? Yep, thank you. So, moving on then, members, to item six is the com our committee inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 on care homes. Can I advise members that an expert in the field of epidemiology is joining us today by video conference to brief the committee on lessons learned from the management of previous international pandemics in order to inform our inquiry on care homes. So, I would now like to welcome and to thank very much for, for giving his time to the committee this morning. Professor Ben Cowling, who is Head of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health, University of Hong Kong. Professor Cowling, could you please go ahead and brief our committee? Thank you. Hi, very good to see you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I'll just say a few words to start and then I'm happy to, to discuss and answer questions. Um, the first thing to say is that in respiratory virus pandemics through the ages, we know that elderly are often the most vulnerable group. In recent years, influenza epidemics, and also to a lesser extent pandemics, have had an enormous effect on elderly, outbreaks in elderly homes annually cause uh, considerable health impacts. So for seasonal influenza, one of the priorities has been to deal with outbreaks in elderly homes and try to reduce morbidity and mortality in elderly homes. In COVID-19, we face the same problem. Around the world, many, many, uh, sorry, a, a high proportion of mortality, of all mortality, has occurred in elderly homes. I know in Northern Ireland, that's also the case. I think about a third of your COVID-19 deaths have occurred in elderly homes. For Hong Kong, where I live and work, is the same. About a third of all of our COVID deaths so far have occurred in elderly homes. And so figuring out the best ways to protect these settings from COVID-19 is a priority. And one of the things I wanted to, to share with you today is the idea of regular testing. I'm aware that in Northern Ireland, you're doing regular testing now in elderly homes. I looked it up on the internet. I found out you're testing staff every two weeks and residents once every month. I think that's great and that will help. It will help to identify outbreaks earlier and enable intervention more quickly so that we can protect elderly homes from outbreaks. We can protect the residents, particularly from being infected and then having the, the risk of a more severe infection. One of the research activities that I'm working on now is looking at the idea of a more efficient approach to regular testing. And I think you could consider it in Northern Ireland. The idea goes like this. Right now, you're testing staff every two weeks, but what you could do is for every pair of staff members, you could put their sample together in the lab and do one test on two people, a paired test. If it's negative, you assume both those staff are negative. If it's positive, you go back and test both the staff individually. And so by doing that, you might be able to get up to weekly testing for staff. You lose a tiny bit of sensitivity by putting samples together, but you gain a lot of extra tests being done, a lot of extra people being tested. 
And I think weekly testing or even more frequently than that would help a lot. Right now in Northern Ireland, your daily numbers of cases are, are still relatively low. So maybe now's not the right time to, to start that. But as you see numbers of infections rise, and they may do, maybe not now, but, but later in the winter, I think there's an opportunity to look at even more regular testing in care homes. To me, that would be probably a top priority in terms of response to COVID. Of course, social distancing is critical, critical in the community to reduce infections in the community. But I think elderly homes are where we're going to see the greatest impact in your second wave and in Hong Kong in our future waves of infection as well. So is that a good enough introduction or would you like to hear more about the situation in Hong Kong? Um, I think we'd like to hear a little more about the situation in Hong Kong. We're, we're, we're looking across a range of areas, um, including discharge policy, uh, testing, PPE, um, staff, staffing issues and, and things like that. So if you could give us, in terms, of, in terms of what you see as best practice that's being implemented in Hong Kong that may be transferable to our situation, that would be maybe very, very helpful, Bear. Right. All right, so in Hong Kong, we have a population of 7 million people, very dense population, actually saying 7.5 million people now, very, very densely populated. We have a lot of elderly homes, mostly they're small, um, and some, st- some homes will have shared staff across multiple homes, maybe networks of elderly homes where staff work in different homes on different days. Uh, the elderly homes, once COVID hit, elderly homes moved to a policy of no visitors allowed and stricter control over staff, stricter control over admissions into the homes as well. New admissions were often separated from the other residents for two weeks. In, our, in the last nine months, we've had two reasonably sized epidemics of COVID-19. The first was in March and April with about a 1,000 laboratory confirmed cases. A lot of those from uh, people infected outside of Hong Kong traveled in and confirmed here, but not infected here. And then we got that under control with social distancing measures. We then had a period of quiet. And in July and August, we've just got over our second major wave with about 4,000 confirmed cases, mostly locally, and about 100 deaths cumulatively, including 30 to 40 as a result of outbreaks in elderly homes. In our third wave, once we identified outbreaks in elderly homes, the government in Hong Kong decided on a quite, quite an interesting strategy. We have a field hospital out by the Hong Kong airport, which has a lot of capacity for isolating people. And in another part of the facility, a lot of capacity for quarantining exposed persons who may or may not have been infected just to to be really, really cautious. Quarantine has been a big part of our response to COVID-19 all along with contact tracing, quarantine in special facilities. And what we've been able to do with elderly homes is once a case is identified in an elderly home, all the residents of the home will be moved to this field hospital. If they're, if they're cases, if they're positive by PCR, they'll be placed in isolation. And if they're negative, they'll be quarantined as a precaution but in this special facility rather than kept in the elderly home. And we have the capacity to do that. We've created this this facility, especially for COVID-19, because I think we recognize that if there's an outbreak initiated in an elderly home, if we don't move the residents out, there's really a risk that the outbreak will grow, especially in Hong Kong. Everywhere is so densely packed. Elderly homes are no different, really the density of people inside elderly homes here is really high. Uh, often it's like an open office with cubicle style uh, beds. It, we don't have individual rooms for, for the residents. And so being able to decant those elderly homes with outbreaks to somewhere else has been really an advantage for us here. So right now we're having low numbers of cases every day in Hong Kong. Hopefully we can keep that, uh, keep the numbers of cases low for a period of time I guess we'll have a fourth wave sooner or later, and then we'll be back to the same measures with elderly homes having no visitors, um, staff being very, very careful, hopefully regular testing of staff, although that is not in place here yet. I'm hoping that it will be very soon. And then once outbreaks are detected, decanting the residents to special facilities uh, and then being managed, managed very, very carefully. Over. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor. I have a number of, of indications from members who would like to ask you some questions. I suppose um, in relation to the testing issue, and, and you've, you've flagged up a, a potential way to um, increase capacity within, within testing, does that, does that indicate that you would be concerned that the, the capacity at present or the regularity of testing may not be of, of maximum sort of benefit that we should be considering looking at testing more regularly? I think in Northern Ireland, I, I, I read on the internet that you're testing every two weeks, testing staff every two weeks. I think there would be a definite advantage to testing every week, if not even a little bit more frequently every five days, because we know outbreaks can develop quite quickly and we, we know it is not always easy to pick up the initial cases in an outbreak. So by testing more regularly, you get a head start on outbreaks as opposed to if you weren't testing that regularly and you were picking up cases because they're of illnesses. So I would encourage you to look into that. Um, I think it could save a lot of lives testing more regularly. We know in, in staff in elderly homes, if they're younger adults particularly, a lot of infections would be relatively mild, maybe difficult to recognize, maybe asymptomatic but still have a risk of spreading onto the residents. And in, in relation to the issue of, uh, uh, you had said that when, when patients were returned from hospital to the home setting, they were quarantined. Um, in, 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 a, in a situation where that wouldn't be possible or practical within, within home settings, what would the alternative be in relation to that? And um, have, what, what's your thoughts on how you might, learning what we have learned in the past, how you might manage discharge policy in, in the future? It's very difficult. So we do encourage testing maybe on arrival at the home. That would, that would help. And maybe if those newly admitted residents can't be quarantined, maybe a program of more regular testing would help. Maybe every five days, every seven days. So they'd have two or three tests during the first 14 days. Um, and just close monitoring. I'm not sure what else could be done. I, I know it's difficult. People do need to be admitted into the into their elderly homes. And I know some homes don't have the capacity for, for quarantine in, in separate rooms. And of course, staff are going around all the different parts of the home. It's difficult to cope with staff as well. So I, I think testing would, would help. And you mentioned other, other regular monitoring there and in, in the research paper that we have considered in relation to this inquiry, a number of, of sort of uh, measurements or metrics or things have been suggested as helpful. So what, from your experience now at this point in, in COVID-19, what, uh, what type of monitoring would be helpful in, in the situation of a, a sort of a, an early warning system, if you like, for COVID? Hi. Again, that, that's a good question. We know that the majority of COVID infections, I would say even in elderly, are very mild, the majority. It's a minority that progress to, to more severe illness. And I know in elderly homes, there's often issues with cognitive function. So it's not as simple as asking the elderly how they're doing. They can't always express it. So we are seeing a lot of temperature monitoring. And I think that could play a role, daily temperature monitoring. Other than that, I think the metrics would be based on the testing of positive cases and based on illnesses and, and, and maybe outbreaks. Uh, I'm not sure what else can be done. That, that's why laboratory testing is so, so valuable because clinically it's not that easy to pick up COVID-19 until there's a, an outbreak and then you start to see more uh, residents with, with severe illness as part of the outbreak. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. So I'm going to go first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then have Colin on the phone, Jerry, Paula, Alex, Orlea, Alan and Pat. So I'll come back in that order. So Pam. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Professor Carling, for, for being um, at our committee today. It's greatly appreciated. I'm fascinating to hear um, what you have to say about the, the pooling of testing in particular. Um, could you tell me, uh, first of all, if you have any statistics from Hong Kong on um, elderly residents in particular through the testing that, that have shown, or do you have these statistics that, that have shown to be asymptomatic? Do you have those kind of figures? 
I, I do not. I'm sorry. So we have not been doing regular testing as of yet. And I think it's a missed opportunity for us in our second wave in July and August. So we have identified a lot of asymptomatic cases in Hong Kong. We've identified some asymptomatic in, in elderly as well. But I don't have the statistic on, for example, if you were testing in an elderly home, what fraction of, of the infections that you picked up would be asymptomatic. My guess, based on my knowledge of COVID-19 to date, is that there would be quite a substantial fraction asymptomatic even in elderly. Thank you. And um, uh, would there be any additional training required in terms of the, the pooling of testing, or is it similar? Is there any anything in particular? Uh, even no, the, the laboratory technicians can handle that. So they know that they get the two the two swabs. Maybe maybe you do it in pairs. So they get in ten samples from the staff in the elderly home, and they just get two together, pool the the. The, the two samples together and run one PCR test or whatever test they're doing on it and then see the result. And, and of course, they've kept the two original samples so that if there is a positive result on the pool, then they can go back to the original and do it. So there is a, an implication for laboratory technician time. But if one of the restrictions is in terms of the reagents or the PCR machines in terms of how many tests you can do every day and the technicians have the time that they can pull samples, and of course, the the expense of the, the laboratory test is, a, is also a constraint. I think pooling does make sense. I think it really is worth looking at. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Um, do you think this method could be used for households or, or schools? Yeah, I think so. So I, I don't know what your plan is for regular testing in schools. I think in Germany, I have heard of doing some testing in schools at least. Um, in my opinion, schools are a lower risk both for infections in terms of the severity and also in terms of outbreaks. But we have heard of outbreaks in schools around the world. So if you have the resources, you could consider to do some kind of regular testing in schools. And maybe the pooling fraction could be you could pull more because in schools, maybe you, you wouldn't be as uh, disappointed to miss an occasional case as you would be in an elderly home where I think it's really a high priority to pick up as much as you possibly can. I could envisage a scenario where, where children in schools are, are tested in pools of five or even ten and then tested every two weeks, every month, really to keep an eye on the situation, uh, partly as a way to monitor what's going on and also partly as a way to have early identification of outbreaks. But I would say if your resources are constrained, then elderly homes and other institutions, prisons as well, would really be a high priority, more so, in my opinion, than schools. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, going over on the phone to Colin McGrath. Colin, are you there? Colin, can you hear us? And can you go ahead with your yeah. questions, please? Yeah. Sorry, right. um, with the change in speaker mode there, I wasn't able to unmute, but I, I can now, so thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, just I, thank you very much, Ben, for the, for the presentation. It's been very interesting to hear just the perspective of somewhere else. Um, and I'm interested in what you'd said, that you were figuring out how to manage the care home and the outbreaks in the care home uh, setting is, is, was a priority. Um, do, do you feel that not just within Northern Ireland, but right, right around um, the, the world as they responded to the pandemics, that potentially people weren't giving care homes that priority and that that may be how um, a lot of the, 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 the virus crept in? I mean, there would be a lot of concern here in, in Northern Ireland that there was a greater emphasis on the hospital sector um, because of the projected numbers and that care home sectors just weren't necessarily thought about. Um, was that the experience in Hong Kong, or given that you were able to contain it quite quickly, was there the full recognition to both sectors straight away? I, I think we were always aware of the danger to care homes, because from a er very early day in the pandemic, we knew that elderly were the most vulnerable to COVID-19. In Hong Kong, we had our first major epidemic in March and April, and luckily we didn't have any elderly home outbreaks. Maybe there was a little bit of a false sense of security, because in July and August, we did see trans. I think we had six or seven outbreaks. The, ma the largest was 45 cases. It was, it was really a bit of a surprise. We'd had a policy of no visitors 
um, also being careful with admissions into the homes, but the virus was still able to find its way into the homes. And I think that's really a lesson learned. So even for Hong Kong in July, when we'd seen what happened in, in New York, I remember very vividly, so many outbreaks in elderly homes, so many deaths, I think, I think more than 10,000, probably 20,000 plus deaths in their first wave in New York. Uh, and there was really a massive impact in New York of admitting, sorry, discharging people from hospital into the elderly homes and then having outbreaks in, in those elderly homes. And um, yeah, I, I think there's a big lesson learned for, for everywhere in the world. I, I suppose as well, um, and I appreciate what you're saying, that you were probably, you mentioned that Hong Kong, they were maybe lucky the first time around, but there might be something in that because unfortunately virus probably doesn't know luck in, in a sense of getting with a population of 7 million. But I was interested in the point you made that as soon as somebody, you know, good and proper testing, but as soon as somebody was identified, they were taken out of the home and put into a particular place somewhere else. Whereas we seem to just try and isolate them within the home. And then there may be a factor of staff in and out of rooms or potentially people being in and out of rooms that that could have caused a, caused a, a, a sort of transmission of the virus in that way. So that having that separate place where positive cases are taken to, maybe there's some value in that. Yeah, I, I think so. And so in Hong Kong, we're not only taking the positive cases out of the home to isolation, we're taking everyone else out of the home, out of that, that location where there could be virus in the environment, there could be other infections we haven't identified. Everyone else is going to another facility as well for quarantine, where the, the infection control is maybe at a higher level. Yes. Um, everything's very carefully managed for 14 days, I guess. And then whenever things settled, you know, if all the residents are okay, then they can go back to the elderly home where it's been cleaned. We know the virus could, in theory, survive in the environment as well. And, um, and that gives us a chance to test the staff as well. So I think having that facility to, I think they call it decanting. So it is like, you know, moving the staff and the residents, taking the residents particularly out of the home somewhere else where they can be managed very, very carefully for a period of time. That's been really, really helpful. I don't know if it's feasible in other parts. Well, I don't know if it's feasible in Northern Ireland, but it's been really, really valuable here in Hong Kong. And, and the other point that you raised, uh, and I'll finish on this, was the issue of um, the staff mobility, where there's high volume of staff moving between homes working. And, and I think you had mentioned that that was kind of reduced down. Have you any feeling of how they did that? Was it a case of a, a overall perspective of saying, well, if you work part-time here, you work part-time there, and somebody else does the same, that you work full-time in one, and somebody else works? Like, was there sort of a, a management of human resources in a way there to say, to stop that movement back and forward? I, I, so to be honest, I think it's still an issue. I think it's still an issue. It's difficult because I think staff may have different specific roles that they need to go to the different homes to fulfill. So it's not that simple, but it is something that, that I know we're looking at in Hong Kong. Um, I just don't know if it's that easy to solve. There'll be reasons why that's happening. And, and um, it's just an issue to be aware of. Uh, maybe if we're prioritizing testing, those kinds of staff, if we can figure out their characteristics, those kind of staff would be a particular priority because transferring infections from one home to another has been an issue for us in Hong Kong. I think there are a number of our outbreaks that are linked together by these staff that go from one place to another uh, on different days of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Professor. I'm going now to Jerry Carroll. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ben, for that. That's very useful. Uh, a couple of questions. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I think uh, initially we were told there was no deaths in care homes, I think in the first wave in Hong Kong, and I've heard you correctly, there was mm -hmm. around 30 or 40 in the, in the in the second wave. So I'd like to sort of tease that out. Um, and also a specific question on the care homes. Are they run uh, publicly? Are they state run? Uh, or how do they uh, operate? Um, also, I mean, this is according to Google, so correct me if I'm wrong, um, but um, a population of 7.45 million in Hong Kong and 103 deaths from COVID. In Ireland, North and South combined, 6 million uh, population around about. 
and around 3,000 uh, deaths. So obviously, if that's correct, and that's the reading uh, from, from online, then that's obviously quite significant, more deaths here. Um, and just a couple of comments as well from yourself. Um, it seems to be that Hong Kong did, did well, if you can say well, um, in the middle of a pandemic in the first and second wave. But there's a third wave, as you said, on the way. And my cursory reading of this is that it's due to some people being exempt from quarantining, including uh, seafarers, air crew staff, and, and, and others. So um, maybe a, a comment on that, and then have another equation, and I'll. And I'll uh, yeah, I'll wrap right. up. I'll try and remember, <laughs> remember all, all, all of the human secrets. So at the, the beginning, you asked about the, the setting here in Hong Kong, 7.5 million people. We have a lot of elderly. We have an aging population. Um, I don't remember the number of care homes, but I know that a minority are run publicly, and the majority are NGOs, so charity-run, uh, various organizations. Some are linked to religious, uh, how to say, to churches or to other, other faiths. Uh, and, and the corresponding charities. Um, many of our homes are relatively small. I think 100 is a typical size, uh, even less than 100. Um, the second question you asked, sorry, it was in my thread. You asked about the waves in Hong Kong. So let me answer that because I can remember that one. If you Google about Hong Kong's waves, there's something funny because locally, the terminology is that our first wave was in January and February when we were having infections coming in from mainland China without any local transmission. And then in March and April, the local terminology is that was a second wave with about a thousand infections. In my opinion, that's really our first wave. And then we got it under control with social distancing uh, on top of the testing and tracing that we've been doing all through throughout. And then we had a period of quiet and in July and August, in the local media is called our third wave, but in my opinion, it's our second wave because in my opinion, what people call here, the, the first wave wasn't really a wave. So we've had two major epidemics, the first with 1,000 cases, the second with 4,000 cases. I'm sure we've missed some infections, but not a large number. So 100 COVID deaths cumulatively in Hong Kong is a reasonable representation of the impact of COVID in Hong Kong. We've done a really good job in Hong Kong because of SARS in 2003, there was an enormous investment in, in a lot of different aspects in preparation for something like SARS to happen again. So hospitals really stepped up their infection control ever since 2003. Laboratories built up capacity so they could do a lot more testing for a lot more things. Uh, and we've been able to do a lot of testing for COVID and in public health. Uh, the equivalent of our public health agency is called the Center for Health Protection here in Hong Kong, uh, really has built a lot of capacity in infectious disease epidemic control in terms of contact tracing, quarantining people uh, who are contacts of, of cases and so on. And so we have done a good job here in Hong Kong in control of COVID. Our most recent wave in July and August, we think was triggered by these exemptions of maybe maritime workers or air crew, because like New Zealand, we've managed to eliminate COVID. So in Hong Kong, we had zero domestic infections for a period of time in June, probably the end of May and June. And then we had this uh, rising number of cases at the end of June and then into July. And we think that was triggered by exemptions rather than by infections coming in people that, that were under 14 day home quarantine policies. Right now, we're getting close to zero again. If we're lucky, we will get back down to zero. Uh, and then we'll face a period of quiet before perhaps a fourth wave. Uh, we know that elimination is, is something we could achieve, but it would only be temporary. In Northern Ireland, I, I don't know if elimination is on the cards. I've, I've looked at your epidemic curve and you're still having quite, quite a number of cases every day. Um, the effort required to eliminate is, is enormous. In Hong Kong, it's a phenomenal effort to get on top of infections in April uh, to end that, that epidemic. And it's again been a phenomenal effort in August. We've just done, uh, or just attempted to do a mass testing program in Hong Kong. The idea was to test everybody in Hong Kong if they wanted to be tested. Uh, so it would have been up to 7 million tests. In practice, only 1.7 million people went along to get tested. We found quite a number of asymptomatic cases that way, and it was reassuring. It did show that our, our, our recent epidemic is on the way out. Uh, but right now, today, the social distancing measures in Hong Kong have been relaxed. And so I'm a little bit concerned that we may be facing a fourth wave sooner or later. 
whether it comes because of the exemptions in the maritime crew and the air crew not needing to do 14 day quarantine, or whether it comes because we still have infections from our, from our recent epidemic, we haven't gone down to zero. Uh, it's difficult to say, but uh, it is a continuous battle against COVID and we're better prepared now than ever before. But I, I think we are gonna to see the need for social distancing measures periodically in Hong Kong, just like you probably will in Northern Ireland in the okay. next six months. Quick follow up on that, Chair. Just... I'll, go, I'll come back if time allows, Jerry. Okay. I want to be fair to everyone. You got a fair wee crack there, so. Um, thank, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Um, just clearing interest, my daughter um, cleans in a care home at the weekend, and she she will say that um, a lot of the patients or the sorry the residents would be quite upset whenever they're taken by the care assistants down even into the communal, um, the the sort of living room area, um, just to get the, the room cleaned. And so I suppose there's the, the emotional. Um, I'm looking at the emotional impact of moving the patients into these quarantining facilities or into isolation and, and probably more so in terms of the medical, in terms of how their care plans can be managed because a lot of the comorbidities um, and require maybe occupational therapists coming in or others to come in and I'm just wondering how their actual health care support is pr provided. So just really how, how that's monitored and managed and then the second one then really then obviously the, the sad reality in terms of these care homes is that a lot of them may not leave again and how advanced care planning is facilitated when you have such lockdown facilities and the GPs and the family can't come in and then work with people on that advanced care planning. So it's really, I'm looking Sorry. at the emotional side of it. I understand. I, I think it's really important. I can't answer the specifics for Hong Kong, but I would say that when we've looked at moving residents out to special facility, of course, it's going to be very disruptive, but the objective is to protect their health and it's a short-term measure, but I completely understand there are going to be other impacts of that, including the continuity of care, including the, the emotional impact. And I wouldn't like to underplay that, but I, I would say that, that this approach of quarantining the residents really does help to protect their health against COVID-19. And it's not intended to be a long-term thing. It's a kind of emergency measure. So, uh, of course, we need to balance all of the different considerations. But in Hong Kong, we've decided that that's the way to go. In Northern Ireland, I, maybe, maybe different, different considerations, as you said. Uh, I think continuity of care is, of course, extremely important. Sorry, and the second one was the advanced care planning about, you know, the end of life yeah, they, and their uh, wishes. And... Yeah, the, the same issues would apply because, of course, for this 14-day period when the residents are moved out to some other facility, there's different people looking after them. Uh, and I guess different approaches to looking after them as well. It would be more like... Uh, not exactly a hospital, but more managed in that sense in the in the quarantine facility uh, with healthcare workers in full PPE and, and quite impersonal, uh, as opposed to the staff in the elderly home that they're used to. So it is difficult. I'm sure it's really difficult for those maybe two or three weeks that the residents are, are moved out somewhere else. Um, the objective is to, to protect them against COVID-19. And we've seen uh, very, very large outbreaks when initially when we were not doing that. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, once again, and going now to Alex Easton. Alex. Hi, and thank you for your presentation so far. A um, couple of questions, just a wee bit more about um, moving um, people out of care homes. Can I just clarify, do you totally close the entire care home? All, 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 everybody gets moved to this, this centre. Does that include staff? That's my first wee question. Second question is, are you finding that the moving, and it was sort of touched on, is having a, a major detrimental effect on um, residents' mental health, is the, the second question. Um, the third wee question is, what's your position on um, face masks in Hong Kong? Um, how far are you going on that? And my very last question is, where are you on, on vaccine for Hong Kong? Okay, that's a lot of questions. So I'll try and answer a little bit quickly. So for the first question about decanting, if there's an outbreak that's identified in an elderly home, then all the residents will be moved to this special facility, which is a quarantine facility for people who may have been exposed. And they're managed very carefully by, by, by the staff there. The elderly home staff who may have been exposed to infection because of working in the elderly home, 
will be taken to a separate quarantine facility, most likely. They would be handled as quarantine persons. They wouldn't continue to work. So they would be monitored for maybe 14 days to see if they've been infected or not. Uh, you asked about the mental health impact. I don't have any information on that. I'm sure there's mental health impact. But at the same time, the objective of this approach is to protect their, their physical health against COVID-19. You asked about masks. In Hong Kong, from the very beginning of COVID-19, we've had almost universal use of face masks in the community. And in elderly homes, as much as possible, the residents will wear face masks and the staff will wear face masks all the time, for sure. And they were doing that before COVID-19 anyway. Uh, I think it goes back to SARS, where there's been kind of widespread acceptance of surgical face masks as something useful. Now, in Hong Kong, we have community, so we have widespread use of face masks in the community ever since the beginning, but that has not been enough to stop us from having an epidemic in March and April and another epidemic, a large epidemic in July and August. So we do believe face masks are useful and my own personal scientific research in face masks, I think is part of that story, showing that face masks do work, they do have a value. At the same time, we can't rely on face masks. We know that we need other measures where in Hong Kong, we're doing a lot of testing and tracing and we've needed social distancing to successfully contain both of our large epidemics so far. The last question was about vaccines. Right now, the government is looking at all the possible avenues to get hold of vaccines as soon as possible, uh, looking at the WHO COVAX program and also talking to individual manufacturers, as far as I know, to try and get advanced purchase agreements with whichever vaccines and whichever vaccine producers we can. So we understand that making advanced purchase agreements will cost money for Hong Kong. Trying to get a vaccine sooner may cost more than waiting until later to get vaccines. But at the same time, the economic impact of, of COVID in Hong Kong is phenomenal. Every month that we wait for a vaccine has an enormous economic and social cost. So we'd really like to get vaccines as soon as we possibly can. We're anticipating maybe we can get vaccines at least for the elderly next year, April or May. Uh, I'm not sure if we were to get it sooner than that and for the whole population maybe by next summer towards later in 2021. And once in Hong Kong, we have vaccines available for everybody, for all 7.5 million people. I think that's when we start to th see things get relatively back to normal. So that would be later in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. And our Leah Flynn, yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ben. The presentation's been very interesting um, and insightful so far. I just wanted to ask a question. In the briefing paper, um, you had spoke about the variability in transmission, um, so that some people are highly contagious and some less so, and also mm. around the incubation um, period being it can vary from between one to 14 days. Um, now, I know you mightn't have an answer to this question, but I'm just wondering, within Hong Kong, are you aware of, have you begun to identify any sort of local trends or profiling on the, the variability of transmission and that incubation period? Yes, a really good question. For the incubation period, the average is about five or six days, and we haven't seen a lot of factors related to variability in that. We know some people are shorter, some people are longer. No particular reason why that's the case. You know, it's not age, it's not sex, it's not those kind of things. In terms of transmission potential, we've seen quite a number of super spreading events in Hong Kong, in bars, uh, nightclubs, uh, restaurants in some cases, other places where there's lots of people gathered together. And the originator, maybe the index of those super spreading events has tended to be a young adult more often than not. But we don't know what makes one person special in terms of, you know, why can one person be a super spreader and maybe other people can't. We just recognize that stopping super spreading can really be a very important aspect of controlling COVID-19. And the way to stop super spreading is in Hong Kong. We close bars, we close nightclubs, we close other leisure facilities. And we stop large numbers of people from gathering together. We have group size limit of four right now. Uh, so anywhere where there might be more than four people who know each other gathered together is, is not really supposed to happen. Um, and I think that's made a big difference. That's probably the most effective or one of the most effective measures we've used in Hong Kong is effectively targeting super spreading. Stop super spreading and you can have a big effect on COVID transmission. Thank you, Ben. And, and just one more in relation to the, the, um, the operation that you are carrying out within the car homes. Um, it's been mentioned previously around that some countries, I'm not sure if it, it relates to Hong Kong, but that they have infection control officers. And I'm wondering, is that something that you um, have within your, 
your car homes um, within Hong Kong, and also the model of testing kits. The testing kits, the testing procedure that you use in car homes, is that the same testing kits that you would use in the wider health system? Because I know here our testing kits in car homes are different from those that are being used in the hospitals, and there has been discrepancies, um, you know, um, amongst some of the results. So I'm just wondering, do you use the same testing kit right across the board, or is there differences? In Hong Kong, ever since SARS in 2008, there's been an enormous attention paid to infection control in hospitals and also in care homes and other parts of the community. So in care in elderly homes, we do have designated staff for infection control, um, and I think that's been important. And in hospitals as well, we have a lot of infection control staff. We have link nurses in every ward for infection control. In terms of, sorry, the second question. The testing kits, are they the same? Testing kits, sorry, sorry. So all the testing is done centrally in Hong Kong in designated laboratories. Uh, so it's the same test being used for diagnosis for hospital patients as it is for people with mild symptoms going to the GP, as it is for the, the testing being done in elderly care homes. It's the same throughout, and it's done in the public health laboratories in Hong Kong. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Thank you very much. And moving then to Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, uh, our health service here in Northern Ireland uh, at the start of this pandemic uh, was in a pretty bad place. Um, staff morale, though, uh, suffering from lack of investment uh, over recent years, uh, long waiting lists uh, for consultation and procedures. But you've talked there about uh, your hospital system uh, had learned something from the SARS infection and that uh, there had been considerable uh, investment uh, in hospitals and no doubt uh, a, a lot of uh, PPE was stored uh, in your hospitals. Um, would you say that that preparation uh, gives you a good starting point uh, to deal uh, with the, the outbreak of, of COVID in Hong Kong? Um, in relation, uh, Professor, to pool sampling, I find that quite interesting, actually, and, and uh, could be extremely useful. But in terms of the, just to help me understand it, you talk about maybe 10 staff members being sampled, and you take two as a pair. I assume that what you do is you, you mix the cocktail of those two samples and test that as one sample. But, and if it comes back negative, you make an assumption that the other eight people in that group of 10 are, are clear or negative. Is there a guarantee uh, that that is the case? Um, is, is there a possible margin of error? And is, is it sort of, is that methodology and approach, is it backed up by sort of scientific uh, evidence that's the right way to go? But it is a very, I think it is a very interesting scheme. Uh, and just to remind me, just, uh, I maybe missed it, if you just remind me, how often are the residents of homes um, tested currently? Good. Okay. So let me talk about the first thing first. Uh, ever since SARS in 2003, we've had investment in Hong Kong in infection control. We've recognised that it's really, really important because in SARS in 2003, we had 1,700 cases, probably pro per capita, the highest in the world. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of infections in healthcare workers and quite a number of deaths of healthcare workers. So we recognised it was really important to, to be better at infection control, better at protecting staff. Uh, we have isolation rooms. I think in Hong Kong, we have 40,000 hospital beds for our 7.5 million population. We have 1,400 negative pressure isolation rooms. It's an incredible number per capita. 1,400 negative pressure isolation rooms uh, for, you know, for something like COVID, for something like a, a pandemic. And it was ready... It was here where we were able to use those uh, those rooms for COVID. And we have stockpiles of PPE and staff that are very well trained in using them. Uh, and of course, masks throughout, universal masking in hospitals and so on. Uh, your second question was about pooling. So if I could explain it like this. Um, if you have individual vials of uh, swabs from your staff in elderly homes, maybe you've got one staff out of the 10 who's who's got the virus and the other nine do not. If you test individually, you should pick up the one who's got it. It'll be positive. If you mix that vial with another vial, you dilute what was in the first one. You dilute the, the, the staff who had the virus with another staff member who didn't have the virus. 
but most of the times there's such a lot of virus in the tube from the staff who's got an infection that it doesn't make a lot of difference. There is a sensitivity loss of maybe 10% in a pooled sample, in testing a pooled sample if you pair, pair the samples together. But if you imagine, okay, one thing you could do is just test everybody individually every two weeks. Another thing you could do is test everybody every week with a 10% drop in sensitivity. The latter is better because you get more frequent results. You, get, you, you do have a, a small chance of missing an infection, particularly with a low viral load. But on average, in the long run, you pick up more and you pick it up more quickly. So, I mean, if you're going to seriously consider it, you can, you can approach maybe a, a health expert in Northern Ireland to do the calculations for you. We're doing them here for Hong Kong, and there's really a very substantial advantage uh, to testing more frequently, even with that trade-off of a slight loss in sensitivity. Now, of course, if you have the resources, you could test everybody every week individually. But if you're facing a situation where you maybe don't have enough, you don't, you know, you, you just don't have the resources, the, the PCR kits or whatever, to do that. Uh, really, what we're, our results of our research here in Hong Kong is that pull, pulling the samples together is really a, a more efficient approach to use the resources that you do have. And we're confident, very confident, that it will save lives. What was your last question, sorry? Just the, the, the residents. How, how often are you currently... Testing so residents in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, actually, unfortunately, we, we're not doing routine testing yet. I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to start very soon. We just did a mass testing program in the community, testing 1.7 million people out of the 7.5 million people in Hong Kong. Resident care homes, for some reason, were not included in that program. Um, so I'm hoping the government is going to start a program for regular testing, particularly of staff. I think staff would be the top priority, uh, and then residents as well. Uh, so. I, when I looked up what's happening in Northern Ireland, I think it's really good to test the staff every two weeks and the residents every month. The staff would be the priority. So, so currently in Hong Kong, there's no testing in nursing homes of either staff or residents? No routine testing. No routine testing of staff or residents in Hong Kong right now. I really hope it's going to start soon. There's discussions about it, but right now, not yet. I think it's really, really important. I think we should be doing it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. And I'm wondering, is that is that then linked to the strategy of of instead moving people en masse into a quarantine facility because of that, that lack of testing? So that has occurred once outbreaks have been recognised. And in the briefing paper that I circulated, I showed there's outbreaks of between 5 and 45 cases. I think if we'd been doing regular testing, we would have found outbreaks at an earlier stage. And instead of having outbreaks of between five and 45 cases, maybe we'd have been having outbreaks of between, say, two and five cases, because we pick it up so quickly, we're able to intervene much more quickly. And that's my hope for future waves in Hong Kong, that we will no longer see large outbreaks in care homes. Of course, the virus may still have a chance to get in, but we'll be able to pick it up more quickly and prevent those large outbreaks. Okay. Thank you. And going then finally to Pat Sheehan. Pat, are you there on the phone? I am um, indeed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Ben, for your contribution this morning. It's been very interesting. And, and most of the questions I had have already been answered. However, I, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, process of decanting residents into uh, a sort of quarantine situation. And uh, in, in terms of... Uh, preventing the virus getting into care homes. I mean, there, there are a lot of steps that could be taken, uh, you know, stopping visits, uh, ensuring staff aren't moving from one home to another, uh, regular testing and, and so on. However, um, and particularly around the issue of decanting, it has been highlighted already that there could be issues around, you know, disturbance of, of care plans, uh, mental health issues and so on. And particularly here, and I, I don't know what the situation is in Hong Kong, but it's reckoned here that maybe 70% of, of care home residents suffer from dementia uh, from one degree uh, to another. And um, I, I'm wondering, does the are there different levels of compliance in different cultures? 
Uh, I mean, here in the West and, and, and here in Ireland anyway, a lot of relatives of care home residents have been saying that the lack of human contact during the, 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 the lockdown period led to physical and mental deterioration uh, in their loved ones. So I suppose what I'm asking is, is there a balance to be struck there or in, in Hong Kong where there may be different uh, levels of compliance in terms of trust in government and, and public health messaging uh, and, and so on? Is, does that become an issue? And just one second quick question that I want to ask you, and it may not be your field, so don't feel uh, it's necessary to give me an answer. I've read some research that uh, has said that deficiencies in vitamin D and deficiencies in zinc uh, uh, can lead to higher mortality rates. I'm not sure whether that research has been validated or not, but if you want to comment on it, feel free. Thanks. So for the first question, undoubtedly, there are these other impacts on elderly when they're decanted. I think in Hong Kong, because of the setting in the elderly homes where it's so crowded and there's such a risk of a large outbreak, I could envisage almost all residents being exposed to infection if an outbreak was allowed to, you know, if it wasn't controlled. And we don't have individual rooms in many of these elderly homes, so it's not possible to just isolate residents who are COVID cases in their own rooms because it's shared spaces. It, it's really, really people living on top of each other, even in the elderly homes. So decanting is, is a very obvious good choice in terms of COVID-19, in terms of preventing COVID-19 outbreaks in the homes and preventing them from getting larger. But as you said, I, I understand there can be a trade-off as well I'm, I know in Hong Kong, the, the elderly are suffering because they don't have visits from their relatives and, and loved ones. And I, I think it's just a really difficult time all around. I'm not sure if there's any best answer. We just have different bad choices to choose between. And we have to choose you know, which bad choice we prefer. Um, the second question about zinc and vitamin D, I'm not sure. It's not exactly my area. Um, I know for other infectious diseases, there's talk from time to time of these kind of patterns, but, but no really uh, established pattern, I would say, uh, whether it's in terms of transmission or whether it's in terms of severity. So for COVID-19, um, I, I think I would wait and see. Right now, certainly nothing conclusive. And based on what we've seen with other infectious diseases, I would say relatively lower chance of something really being there but of course would not rule it out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank, thank, you. you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Um, Professor, I suppose, and, and again, this, this may not be directly your feeling, I don't want to put you on the spot, but just when we have the benefit of, of your experience, maybe there has been some talk recently about the potential for what's been called a circuit breaker, um, mm -hmm. whereby, you know, potentially around using the fact that, that schools close for a week at midterm or that, that you would do a short intervention of maybe two weeks of an enhanced restrictions, maybe not a full lockdown, but a kind of a more enhanced set of restrictions. What would your view be on the impact that might have or, or what issues might need to be considered before you would, you would uh, undertake such action? Yeah, I, I remember very distinctly early in COVID-19, I think it was in March, looking at some results from Imperial College London about the possible strategies to respond to COVID-19 and looking particularly at the choices in not exactly lockdowns, but in terms of the intensity and duration of social distancing measures and there being a trade-off. You could either choose longer periods with moderate social distancing or maybe shorter periods, as you mentioned, like circuit breakers with more intense social distancing to get things under control. And I think probably the, the most important thing to consider would be if those different possibilities, like a longer period with moderate social distancing versus a shorter, more intense, what would the economic consequences of those different approaches be? What would the social consequences be? If schools are closed anyway, maybe that's a good opportunity to, to, to have stronger social distancing in that week. Um, because the children are going to be at home anyway. So you could, you could maybe think about uh, encouraging people to work from home even more in that week than other weeks. I guess it would be different um, 
in Northern Ireland and other parts of the world as well. In, in Hong Kong, we've never gone to that extreme. We've had, I would say, moderate social distancing in, in March, April and in, in August to get our transmission under control and bring numbers down to a low level. But we are facing the need to do this periodically. Uh, the way that we've been doing social distancing is, is closing bars, nightclubs, cinemas, other leisure facilities, gyms, swimming pools and so on, uh, reducing people, re reducing the capacity of restaurants, uh, maximum table size four, uh, and then the government and private business encouraging people to work from home. We've seen about 50% uh, of working adults being able to change their working behavior so they work at home at least some of the time in Hong Kong. And, and all these social distancing measures have helped a lot. Uh, for Hong Kong, I don't know whether we would consider having more intense social distancing for a shorter period of time. Um, I, I think it would be difficult. Um, so uh, over. Thank you. So, um, I just have a quick point from Pam and Jerry. Did you want a very quick follow-up point Please. from earlier? Yeah. No. And then I'll, I'll go to I'll go to Jerry first, and then finish with Pam. Thank, thanks. Um, just quickly, just if you could tease out the um, sort of the, the approach taken after SARS, because I think I read somewhere that mm -hmm. there was a concern that the governments were kind of treating this pandemic initially as an influenza rather than a SARS-type disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think there's been warnings from epidemiologists for many years about these type of outbreaks. So what can be done sort of in, in the north here, in the UK and across Europe, the likes of the Centre for Disease Controls? What examples can we learn now? Because these viruses are likely to be with us for, for some time. Yeah, I think the biggest lesson probably relevant to COVID-19 has been the investment in infection control in hospitals. We've really stepped up the infection control training, uh, the resources, the PPE, the usage, the training, and then also having all these negative pressure rooms. We really stepped that up after SARS, uh, which was in 2003. So that's more than 15 years of investment. And that's paid off. So in Hong Kong, we have not had, as far as we know, a single occupational infection of a healthcare worker. We've had 5,000 confirmed cases. There have been a handful of cases in people who are healthcare workers. But as far as we know, those are community exposures not occupational exposures uh, leading to their infections. And that's remarkable because around the world in the past nine months, we've seen so many healthcare worker infections, even deaths. In mainland China, a lot of uh, healthcare worker infections and, and deaths in March. Um, in, Ireland, in Northern Ireland, I'm, I, I would imagine, I haven't looked it up, but I imagine you've had healthcare worker infections. I, I'm not sure about mortality. So in Hong Kong, I repeat, 5,000 confirmed cases in Hong Kong, people of all ages, 100 confirmed deaths, not a single, as far as we know, not a single occupational infection of a healthcare worker because of the investment in infection control since SARS. And I think a lot of places in the world are going to be looking at investing in infection control um, after this is all over and in anticipation of future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, kind of the public mindset in Hong Kong. Um, and you'd mentioned that mask wearing is universally accepted there and it's, mm. it's a very new concept to the UK and to Northern Ireland and we have had uh, quite a negative feedback from members of the public and it, there's quite a lot of negativity um, on the ground and in terms of social media. Uh, I'm just wondering in terms of social distancing because obviously it's, it is more important, I'm sure you'd agree, than the actual mask wearing, not that one Ways other, but I think it, I think it probably is the most important element of it, and I think the worry is that uh, people then feel when they're wearing a mask or even when they're forced to wear a mask, that then the, that the social distancing is not as important, and they can get closer, and that can be a, a greater concern. So what I'm asking is, in terms of the the mindset of the public in Hong Kong, have they uh, universally accepted social distancing requirement? Yeah, of course, there's fatigue with social distancing after it's been in place for, for some time. So we've just come to the end of our uh, recent epidemic in July and August, and there was a lot of fatigue in the community with the social distancing measures. People very frustrated that, that they're having to stay at home more than they would normally like to do. They can't go out to, to restaurants because at one point we had a table size restriction of two. So you could only eat with one other person in a restaurant in Hong Kong. Uh, we never closed restaurants because they're so important locally. A, a lot of people live in very, very small flats and don't cook for themselves. So they rely on eating out in restaurants uh, on a daily basis. 
in terms of compliance with mask use, in Hong Kong, we've, we've had a history of wearing masks going back to SARS. During SARS epidemic in 2003, about 70% of people in Hong Kong wore masks all the time. Uh, they were so concerned about it. And ever since then, there's been a culture of wearing masks, uh, particularly when people are sick, but also in, in, uh, in other epidemics. Uh, as I said, in Hong Kong, since January, since the end of January, we've had 99% of people wearing masks out and about on the street and in public areas, and, and also a lot of mask wearing in workplaces. Uh, hospitals have universal mask policy, so everybody in a hospital wears a mask all the time, uh, unless they're eating and, um, or, or sleeping. And so there's widespread acceptance of face mask use, and we haven't seen any, any consequence in terms of compliance with social distancing. We've been able to do both, but I understand it has been a concern um, that maybe people would think if they're wearing a mask, they don't need to socially distance. I can only say in Hong Kong, we have not found that to be the case. People are very good at social distancing when there's a lot of COVID in the community in, in March, April, and again at the end of July. Uh, really very uh, compliant with, with doing uh, the right thing, I guess, with, with staying at home as much as they can and staying away from large groups of people. Thank you, Professor. And just a final, a final one. This is really the final one from me. Um, are you still maintaining strict visiting into care homes, uh, given that you have the other the other measures in place? So, or can you? Does that allow you to relax the visiting to address loneliness and mental health and those types of issues? Or where where are you at presently on that on that issue? Right now, visitors are still restricted. Uh, we would relax it if all the other measures in Hong Kong are being relaxed. And that did happen in June. Right now, not yet being relaxed, although every home can, to some extent, have a little bit of flexibility. But right now, no visitors allowed. And I think that's going to... I mean, if it's relaxed, it will be back in place very, very quickly uh, if or when we have a, another epidemic in the community. Um, I think, unfortunately, I mean, although visitors are really important for the mental health, visitors are also one of the ways that the virus is able to get into the homes and limiting visitors or stopping visitors as we do in Hong Kong has been an important measure uh, to protect elderly homes against outbreaks. And I, I really just hope that it, it won't have to go on for much longer. Um, another six months, I guess. Uh, as I said before, we, we just have a lot of bad choices and we have to choose between them. Um, it's, it's really a difficult situation for everyone. Okay. Thank you. And, and listen, Professor Cowley, I want to very sincerely thank you on behalf of the members and, and the entire committee. I think that has been actually a fascinating session. We've heard some things which were entirely new, I have to say, and those are, those are going to be very interesting for us and demonstrates the benefit of having a perspective from somewhere entirely different. So I think you have greatly assisted the committee this morning and I thank you very sincerely. Thank you and good luck for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Now. Okay, members, I'm going to take a quick break there in order to get our next, our next uh, officials from the department online. So if members, could we come back at uh, 11.35, please? For starting. Thank you. This is a okay, members, um, thank you. We are now resuming. And uh, can I just advise that, that we officials request we take items 8 and 10 before item 7 just to accommodate urgent meetings that they're involved in. So are members content with that? We go to the top of, uh, we go to item 8 to 10 on this section. Thank you. So um, the next three agenda items are further travel restriction statutory regulations. Members will remember that we deferred two of these SRs from last week in the absence of information on the evidence base previously raised by the committee or an official to answer related questions. I can advise members that officials are here today to brief the committee on the regulations. And I would now like to welcome Professor Ian Young, Chief Scientific Advisor, and Miss Elaine Colgan, Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. You're both very, very welcome here this morning. And uh, can you please go ahead then, um, Professor Young, and give us a, your briefing on these, on these SRs, please. Um, so I think Chairman that Elaine is actually going to provide the briefing and I'm just here for backup if required. Okay, uh, so we'll go then, Elaine, can, can you hear us okay and can you go ahead with the briefing? Um, yes, uh, thank you Chair. Thank you. Um, so I um, will now give a briefing on the risk stratification 
trigger points and thresholds in respect of countries added to or removed from relevant lists. There is a formal weekly process by which ministers make decisions on international travel corridors. These decisions are informed by risk assessments provided by the Joint Biosecurity Centre, JBC, working closely with the Public Health England, using a methodology endorsed by the four chief medical officers of the UK. Risk assessments for border advice are focused on the UK public health risk posed by incoming travellers to the UK relative to the current UK domestic COVID-19 situation. JBC and PHE monitor over 250 countries, territories and selected islands on a daily basis to inform these risk assessments. A number of indicators are used to flag specific countries that are then subject to a focused epidemiological deep dive to inform a change in risk rating. Crossing a weekly incidence rate per 100,000 population is one such indicator of a country, territory, island increasing in risk. But other factors may also inform this, such as a rapid or exponential increase in incidence or evidence of a significant number of imported cases to the UK from this area. Countries, territories or islands that have a decreasing risk from COVID-19 and could merit a reduction in risk rating are also identified through indicators. Deep dive allows for a broader number of qualitative and quantitative indicators to be considered in combination to reach a professional judgment of the risk posed. Factors considered include an assessment of the proportion of the population that is currently infectious in each country, territory or island, i.e. the point prevalence, the weekly population adjusted case incident rate, taking into account population size of the country, territory or island, trends in incidents, deaths and hospitalizations, information on testing capacity, testing regime and test positivity rate, an assessment of the quality of the data available and the public health systems, imported infections identified through UK contact tracing, transmission status and international epidemic intelligence, extent and effectiveness of measures being deployed by a country, territory or island, and volume of passengers coming into the UK from that country, territory or island. Risk assessments are presented to ministers who make the final decision on travel corridors and implementation. Once Northern Ireland received the JBC analysis, this is passed to the Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officer for consideration in the local context. Advice is then submitted to the Minister for consideration and decision. In terms of data analysis, that is all I am able to share with the committee by way of an open session, as not all of the data is in the public domain. Indeed, some of it is shared with Department of Health and Social Care in England privately for the sole purpose of assessment of travel corridors. Work is ongoing in it, on picking the elements of data analysis that can be made public. Pending this completion, I am happy to provide further detail on data for the countries under discussion today. However, I would have to request a closed session in order to do this. Okay, Elian, thank you. Um, and you have indicated there that you, you said that that there was a professional judgment made based on a number of on a number of issues such as prevalence, adjusted case, adjusted case uh, increases, incidents, um, and trends, and the assessment of accuracy. So, um, can you can you explain to us how the prevalence rates in a country impact? And you, you said that you said that the Department of Health in England receive information privately. Is that shared in private with our CMO and with our Department of Health here? Um, I'll, I'll ask Ian to answer the first part of the question, but in terms of the second part, um, we, the, the, we get the full the resulted analysis, so the completed analysis from JBC. Um, we don't necessarily see all of the individual pieces of data that have contributed to that. Um, and I'll maybe just hand over to Ian to answer the first part, if that's okay. Yeah, so, um, so we do see a, a considerable amount of very detailed information um, about the countries which are under consideration during any week. And as I said, um, Elaine would be in a position to share um, that um, in, in closed session so that the committee could understand the amount of detail involved. Um, 
there is a, a qualitative judgment involved, but the key factor, the most important data that we look at is the prevalence of COVID in the countries under consideration. And that comes from data which is um, published by the countries themselves. In the case of European countries, it's publicly available on the um, ECDC um, website. Um, but in addition to that, we receive information about the amount of testing, which is critical in terms of understanding the reliability of the um, estimated prevalence in different countries. The trends, so we're more concerned if a particular country seems to have rapidly rising prevalence than if prevalence is relatively constant or declining. Um, and then in addition, we take account of the number of travellers who are likely to be coming to Northern Ireland from the country concerned. The prevalence in Northern Ireland at the point of time and information from our test, trace and protect um, centre who provide us at the moment twice per week with um, numbers of cases which have been associated with travel outside Northern Ireland in the previous 14 days. OK, and I suppose the committee's, the committee's concern in relation to this is partly the issue of uh, differences in prevalence rates here at a given time versus what, what may have been. So, for example, around the start of July, we had prevalence rates here per 100,000 of uh, new, te new, new positives of around about three three per day, where I think at that particular point in time in England, more, more broadly, it was around about 15. So if you're applying the, the same uh, kind of... A, the same kind of modelling. How is it that our system has always been the same as? So surely, where our rates were much lower than England, and unfortunately and regrettably, we have now went to a situation where actually ours are worse. But given there's no there's no uh, control or tracking for travel east west, and our rates were very much lower, how come we have never made a single difference to any of the countries that were selected as being appropriate to be excluded for travel? So the, the policy advice which we provide um, from a scientific perspective takes account of the prevalence in Northern Ireland rather than the prevalence in the UK at any point of, in time. It also takes account of the number of travellers who we believe are likely to be coming to Northern Ireland and that's impacted by direct flights. We know that travellers from um, other countries enter Northern Ireland, both east, west and south, north. And it is difficult to get accurate numbers um, for those travellers. However, what we do have is an accurate record of the number of cases at any point in time which have been associated with travel outside Northern Ireland, as I said, in the previous 14 days. So the scientific advice which myself and CMO and provide is based on the prevalence in Northern Ireland and the risk to Northern Ireland of travel from any particular country. OK, and what can you tell us about the prevalence rates in the countries affected as compared with the prevalence rates here um, at the time each of the regulations were made? So were each of those countries assessed individually in relation to the, the situation here in the north? Yes, that is that is what happens, and you know, obviously, it's a rapidly changing situation, both in terms of the overseas country concerned, and in Northern Ireland, and those numbers are different um, every week. But for example, um, today we have looked at the prevalence figures we have for a range of overseas countries which are under consideration, and we've looked at today's figures for Northern Ireland. And the advice that we give at any point in time is based on our knowledge of the current figures in both cases. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to members now with uh, with with questions. So I'm going first to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron. Um, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for attendance here. Um, I just want to ask if uh, if Northern Ireland has deviated from from GB in respect of any decision relating to exempt countries and 
also wanted to ask uh, around Portugal. Have parts of Portugal yo-yoed off, off the list and, um, and how can a longer term approach uh, to these issues be applied to provide better certainty obviously for our, our travel and businesses industries? So I'm, I will I will comment on that, and Elaine can correct me um, in terms of the detail if I get it wrong. However, there have been occasions when there have been differences, certainly in timing between um, Northern Ireland and the decision made in um, England, Scotland, or Wales. And Elaine can probably give some examples um, of that. It is very difficult to get reliable information, both about prevalence and travel from regions of overseas countries and in general we felt um, there's not sufficient reliable information to allow regional discrimination. That is something which might change in the future. I think we've been clear to say that because this is a rapidly moving situation it's unfortunately very difficult to provide a long-term guarantee that um, travel without quarantine from any specific overseas country will remain possible for, for example, even a number of weeks, both because the um, prevalence in Northern Ireland can change very rapidly and because we have numerous examples of where the prevalence in overseas countries has changed very rapidly. Um, Elaine, can you comment on the specific issue of um, where there have been differences between Northern Ireland and the other UK countries? Um, yes, um, so one that strikes me early on that happened was Scotland deviated on Spain. So for a, a, at least a week, if not more than that, um, they were in a different position on Spain. Um, even currently at the moment, the, the challenge is that it's not a case that there's one GB position. Um, so England, Scotland and Wales do deviate, um, not only in terms of timing, but in terms of the countries involved. Um, I, I, I would need to double check, but I'm fairly fairly sure that Wales currently is deviated in terms of the, the particular Greek islands that are um, exempt uh, from the quarantine area. Uh, certainly they had been until recently. That they initially exempted different islands than the ones that we then exempted uh, or removed, sorry. So yes, there, there have been differences and there continue to be differences and it's recognised that that will be the case and there are operational processes in place with Border Force to make sure that that's understood at the border by passengers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going then to Paula, then Colin on the phone and then Jerry. Um, thank you. It's just a follow up on um, Pam's um, question there. Um, um, Professor um, Young, you'd said there about not being able to get the data then to make the regional um, variations, but Germany yesterday, um, they um, imposed restrictions on Lisbon and Brittany. How come Germany is able to get that level of data and information, but the UK government uh, uh, passing down to use are not? So, um, that unfortunately is a question I'm, I'm not able to answer because I'm, I'm unsure exactly what data Germany are using. We have seen um, some regional data um, for some um, overseas countries, but with, with caveats around that. And in particular, we have had concerns that um, if we were to introduce regional um, differences for an overseas country, it would be relatively easy for someone to get around those by um, traveling a short distance in the country concerned and returning to Northern Ireland or the UK via London or Dublin um, from a part of the country which was viewed as being safe. So it's, it's very difficult to know exactly how um, incoming travelers have moved around in a, a country overseas which has significant regional variation in, in prevalence. Follow up. The last time I think we had departmental officials here, we were talking about trying to support those passengers coming back through the airports around testing and um, maybe even some variation on the length of time that people have to quarantine. Is there any progress on that? We're in ongoing discussions um, with ONS and NISRA nationally about a pilot of um, airport testing of incoming travellers. The main purpose of that would be to assist in estimating the prevalence of infection of travel from overseas, but the data that that study will generate 
will also inform a possible consideration of reducing the quarantine time in the future. While there's been you know, significant public interest in the idea that a test at the airport being negative might mean no quarantine, that's simply not a safe approach. If an individual has become infected in the two or three days before returning to Northern Ireland, then they could be carrying the virus, but would test negative at the airport and then would be provided with false reassurance and could go on to spread um, significantly. Um, it may be possible with dual testing, testing at the point of entry to the country and a second test, perhaps around um, five to eight days to reduce the quarantine period. That's currently subject of ongoing um, scientific research. Uh, thank you. I think that was really the point I was getting to. But how, how close are we to maybe introducing these pilots and maybe moving this on a bit? So um, I hope it will be in the next um, in the next three to four weeks. As I say, it's being led nationally in the UK by um, ONS, and um, there was meant to be another meeting about the study this week, which um, they have cancelled. So I think the next scheduled meeting is is next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I'm going now across on the phone to Colin. Are you there, Colin? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I suppose the first element is really just a comment um, that we sort of eventually seem to follow from, from London. Um, I really just think that the British government have not handled this well. Um, I think we have had some of the highest rates in Europe, uh, and yet we have looked at many other regions and many other countries that have much lower rates. And what we've said to them is, almost akin to we don't want to be near you infected lot whenever in fact we are the ones that have probably got the higher rates um, and I'm sure a lot of other European countries and other countries in the world will think it quite cheaply of the British government and their approach to this um, and this has a result of completely uh, compounding the travel industry that is almost on its knees completely businesses that are going to be wiped out individuals that can't get jobs that are unlikely to get jobs in other sectors and um, completely wiped out because of decisions that sometimes don't necessarily um, have credibility. And it was a bit worrying to hear that a lot of those decisions are taken in private and that they're not allowed to release what that information is to the public. And that never helps the public in being able to understand uh, what a particular issue is. But in terms of, and I'll also just mention, not everybody travels just to go off and land a big Many people have family in different parts of the world. And, you know, there's only so many months that the meetings are going to cut it. Um, before people are not going to get to see their parents, they're not going to get to see um, people potentially that pass away, and, and they will miss that opportunity of actually making up. So this is an incredibly important issue. Um, what I was going to ask was, um, you said about if you come back, you may not have symptoms, and therefore you may not know that you've got the condition, but does that not mean if an area has a similar or less rate, seven-day rate, that's just the same here. We could have people in Northern Ireland that don't know today that they have it and they're walking about. And that therefore, to make that differentiation for those that are travelling back from areas that have a similar R number or less, that, that there's just the same risk of them coming back and not displaying symptoms. The advice is that once you display symptoms, you go and get the test. So can that not be the same for those in the travel industry and those travelling? So thank you, and uh, I mean I think that's a, a very important issue. And um, in general, the answer is is yes. That if a country has a similar prevalence to Northern Ireland, that the risk of importing a case is essentially the same as in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, there is a degree of complexity when it comes to interpreting the data, in particular in relation to the amount of testing. So if a country appears to have a similar prevalence to Northern Ireland, but is only doing, for example, one fifth of the amount of testing that we do, then it's likely that they will be significantly underestimating the number of cases which they have. And therefore to make a decision just on prevalence um, would be misleading. So that's where the um, qualitative element of decision making that I referred to earlier comes in. You know, we have to take account of the amount of testing which is being done in other countries 
and the trends in cases and come to the best estimate that we can. But in general, yes, if we believe another country to have a similar prevalence or less than Northern Ireland based on reliable data, then the risk of importing a case um, is really not very different to somebody um, developing COVID through spending the same period of time in Northern Ireland. Okay, I, I, I'll be very quick with this question because I need to actually just step out of the meeting for a couple of minutes here at 12 o'clock. C can I just ask, is there any overwhelming evidence that people are um, contracting coronavirus on airplanes? Um, no, there have been some examples of where people appear to have contacted the virus on an airplane, but the number of cases is relatively low. And to be clear, consistently through the um, recent months, the num percentage of cases um, arriving in Northern Ireland associated with travel outside the common travel area has been less than 5% and often significantly lower than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Colin. And now I'm going across to Jerry. Thanks, sure. Thanks, Ian and Elaine. Just a, a, a comment. I mean, I'm not sure of the, of the reason why uh, it was suggested we need to go into closed session um, for the data uh, conversation. So a bit of clarity on that. You know, I think at a time when there's raising sort of scepticism, uh, I think and transparency um, is, is always important. So a comment on that would be useful, or clarification rather. Um, just on, on Sweden, um, reading the, the regulations, uh, Sweden is uh, exempt from quarantining, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, and I was just looking there, um, there was 1,200 new cases on Tuesday uh, in Stockholm. Uh, there's uh, talk of further restrictions uh, in Stockholm. So I'm just really trying to understand, and I understand things obviously move quickly, but I'm trying to understand the rationale for um, uh, exempting um, people traveling from Sweden uh, from quarantining and whether that's still uh, the right um, path to travel, considering cases are rising and there's talk of further restrictions uh, in that um, city and parts of the country as well. Okay, and do you want me to take this one? Yes, that would be fine, Elaine. I'll comment specifically on Sweden if it's helpful, but if you take the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so in terms of the, the, the closed session, that was really just if the committee wanted country specific data for any of the specific countries that were involved in the three regulations that um, we're, we're looking at today. Um, we're obviously happy to take questions on the general methodology um, in an open session. So that, that was just really the suggestion there. Um, the, the regulations for Sweden were changed on the 11th of September. So the, the decision at that point was based on the 20th days, I think it was before that. So you have to have gone through two incubation cycles um, with the stable um, data in order to get back onto the list. Um, I'll let Ian then take something on more up to date on Sweden and the current situation. Yes, so um, just to assure the committee that, um, that, that this remains, as with a large number of countries, under active consideration and, and careful review. Um, and Absolutely, the cases in Sweden are rising as they are rising significantly in Northern Ireland. So the issue um, becomes what is the differential between Sweden and um, Northern Ireland at any point in time in terms of coming to a decision. And if that moves unfavourably so that we believe the prevalence in Sweden to be higher than the current prevalence in Northern Ireland, then we would certainly advise reconsideration of the position with regard to um, the need for quarantine, as we would for any other country. Um, I think our desire would be to be as transparent as possible with the committee in terms of data and sharing. So, you know, if if the advice um, from the JBC changes, we'll be very happy to share more detailed information with the committee in um, in public session, and we're certainly very happy to share it in closed session if the committee would like to see it. Okay, going to Arlea. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the Elaine, I think it was yourself you had mentioned around the the deep dive um, risk assessments that you are carrying out, um, and I'm just wondering, are they are those deep dive assessments um, are they being carried out across the north and Britain, 
or are they, or is it island wide, um, or, or possibly both? I know that the other week, Elaine, um, I had asked you a wee question just around the, the data sharing um, from north to south, um, and you have mentioned that those discussions are ongoing. So I'm just wondering where that factors in um, to, to this decision making process. Um, is that falling under the memorandum of, of understanding? Um, and just if there's any update on that aspect, thank you. Okay, um, thank you um, for your question. So the deep dive is more about looking at the other countries rather than looking um, at the UK or the, any of the common travel area. Um, that comes really after the deep dive is completed. So the deep dive will give us the information on the other countries and then Ian will consider that for here in context of both the UK situation, the South situation and Northern Ireland specifically. In terms of data sharing with the South, uh, it is very difficult. We had a, a meeting with the legal team this week um, and it gets into GDPR and data sharing across international borders and it is quite tricky. We continue to work on it. It's unlikely to have a quick solution. Um, I wish it were otherwise. Uh, but we we are committed to working on it. It will require a change in legislation, not just here, but probably in the south as well. Um, so there are complex issues, um, and yes, we do continue to work on it. Uh, in terms of does it fall into the MOU? Um, I guess it, it, it could in part um, the the weekly call between CMOs as part of the MOU agreement um, does have travel as a fairly standard uh, agenda item. So this does come up and it is certainly a high priority area that we are both keen to work on. Um, it just unfortunately is very complex um, and it's not proving an easy an easy thing to fix. Thank you very much, Elaine. And I'm just wondering, the um, so the, the meeting with the legal team that was happening this week or is happening this week, um, is there any possibility of updating the, the committee, um, you know, providing us with as much information as possible, maybe of the issues that's coming out of that meeting? I'm just conscious if, if you are looking at, um, you know, if, it's, if it is going to come to legislation, maybe having to be brought into place north and south. Um, do you know the, the quicker and the sooner we can we can move on these things because the data sharing is so is so um, important. Um, so if if that would be okay, if the the committee's content with requesting that, um, thanks, Liam. Yeah, the, the meeting actually was a couple of days ago, um, and I'm happy if the committee would like for, to write in, in more detail as to what those challenges are, um, and I can lay them out and get some legal input to that to make sure that it's framed correctly. Um, so I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Elaine, just in relation to the... Uh, what, what approach does the Home Office and the Joint Biosecurity Centre take to consideration of, say, the, the needs of the North or Scotland or England or any other of the... So do they work to the lowest common denominator in terms of making these decisions? Do they average it out? What type of approach is taken to take account of different levels of prevalence? Um, so the JBC data is is very much um, agnostic of the current situation in any of the DAs. So once they produce their deep dive, their package, um, it's passed to each region, and each region then takes their own scientific advice and their own medical advice, and then a ministerial call is held where the decisions are taken by all four health ministers. Um, sometimes those decisions are the same decision by all four of them, sometimes it's not. Um, but that's kind of the, the decision-making process. The decision-making process is different to the data analysis step, if that um, makes sense. Well, uh, well, I suppose that goes to the nub of, of what our, our difficulty is in relation to what the difference, why it's not just driven by the data. You know, what other considerations are on top of the data are, are, are factored in? <laughs> Sorry, the decision is driven by data, but the, not only the JBC data. So the JBC data then comes to us, and as Ian explained earlier, he then sort of considers that in terms of the Northern Ireland situation, and that's where the minister will then consider both of those things, not just the JBC data. And in relation to the JBC data, um, is that not publicly publicly out there in terms of the European Centre for Disease Control and other other, are all countries' data not essentially published on a regular, maybe daily basis anyway, publicly? They, there is some publicly available information that is involved in the, in the deep dives, but not all of it is publicly available, and some of it is shared privately with them. 
just for the sole purpose of assessment and travel corridors. Um, there's the list of factors that I that I described earlier. Not all of the data for each of them and for each country. Each country publishes a, a variety of information, um, and and so not all of it is publicly available. Okay. Well, um, yes, Professor Young, go ahead. Would it help if I gave an example as to why? why we arrived at a, a different decision in the case of Northern Ireland. Um, and that might be um, the case of the Greek islands, which Elaine referenced earlier. And Wales has a number of direct charter flights from some of the Greek islands concerned, and hence was experiencing a large number of imported cases coming from those islands. Whereas during the same time period, because we did not have any direct charter flights, and we did not have any cases imported from, from the islands. And as a result of that difference, I think it led Wales to come to a different decision based on data than we did, because they were factoring in the additional local data relating to the number of cases they were importing. Okay, well, uh, I am going to go back now to members in relation to the, uh, the, the issue of the closed session. I will say that the committee, I think, largely would, would much prefer that, that our business is conducted with full transparency. We're at a bit of a loss as to why some of these figures, and, and I do believe, actually, more broadly, that countries should be openly, in, in terms of this being a pandemic, that countries all over the world should be openly sharing data to allow decisions to be made that are relevant to the, to the, the suppression of the disease across the world. So I think that's, I think that's uh, an issue of, of concern. But I'm going to go to members and, and, and take views on that. Pam. Yeah, I, sure. I think um, if it would be useful, I'd be happy to propose that we do go on to a, a closed session and in order to get any additional information that might be useful to the committee at this time. Okay. Yeah. Other mm -hmm. views? Yeah. Okay, okay, members. I then propose we will go into closed session to consider the the evidence that that uh, that has been discussed. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty. Okay, thank you, uh, Elaine and Professor Young, for that information. I think I think it is fair to say that the committee remains concerned that, that information that is able to be shared is not being. Uh, published or brought into the public domain, it would appear that that, that may be an issue to do with uh, the sharing from the, J, the Joint uh, Biosecurity Centre. Um, I, I think that in light of, in light of uh, the fact that we as a committee wish to see maximum transparency and to allow, to allow those considerations to be done, that I would propose that we defer these these for another week to allow you, as you as you have indicated there, that you're you're in uh, in in communication with the with the Joint Biosecurity Centre in relation to providing maximum information and providing it in a timely fashion, so that we can consider regulations and prov and provide the scrutiny that we are charged to provide to any ch of these changes. So I'm proposing, members, that we defer a uh, defer consideration of these until our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, members are content. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Elaine Colgan and Professor Ian Young for coming and briefing the committee today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. Um, we will now then revert to section seven. Do we need to take a quick break, maybe, to get the uh, witnesses on the line, the officials? Yes, we'll take a quick break to get the members on the line. Okay, thank you, members. And I, we are now moving into um, section seven, which is the statutory instrument, the Human Medicines Regulations 2012 consultation. And I refer members to tab seven of your pack. Members will recall that the committee recently considered correspondence from the department regarding a, a consultation on amendments to the Human Medicines Regulations 2012 to support the rapid and effective rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine and the influenza uh, vaccine here, and that we requested a written briefing on the result of the consultation at that time. So can I now advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the proposed amendments. I would now like to welcome to this afternoon's meeting Mr. Kenneth Ward, who is Head of Medicines Regulatory Group, Mr. Gerard Collins, Head of Health Protection Policy, 
and Mr. Martin Coleman, Head of COVID-19 Vaccination Programme. And I would like to now invite you uh, officials to go ahead and brief our meeting, please. Thank you. Sorry, Canis, just we're not we're not hearing you there, Canis. Just a second, just speak to me. Are you muted on your end, Canis? Can you just check? No. No, we may have to take a short pause, Canis, just to check out the communications here. We're not hearing you. Thank you. Nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty Nine. So I'm going to just uh, check again there. Do we have Canis on the line? And, and we're checking if we can hear you at this end, Canis. Can you? No, we're not hearing you, Canis. We're going to have to. We're going to have to come back again in another few moments. Okay, we'll now pause again. This is. The Thank you. So we seem to have we seem to have resolved that issue. So now, if I could invite you now, Canis, to go ahead and brief the committee, please. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, so, so thanks for giving myself and colleagues at the department uh, some of your time uh, this afternoon. We're, as you've mentioned, we're here primarily to uh, inform the committee of proposed changes to the human medicines regulations, which are related to the sale and supply and administration of, of vaccines. Um, but members, you may well have uh, questions or queries on the legislation, which hopefully I can answer. And as you've alluded to, we're joined by uh, Martin Coleman and Jared uh, from the department's health protection branch, who should be able to uh, answer questions or queries on, on the vaccine policies of the department. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to answer any any queries the committee or our members have. Uh, in terms of the legislation, the committee has previously been made aware of the proposals, uh, uh, a submission from the minister. And as you've alluded to, the committee was supposed to have a, 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 written, a briefing paper yesterday, which I understand there's been a, a bit of delay in, which I apologise for. It will be with the committee as soon as we're able to. Um, in the minister's briefing paper, there were, you know, it outlined some of the various proposals. Um, but it might be helpful if I give a bit of background and context uh, to the regulations on the proposed amendments, uh, if that would be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Please. Okay. Thank you. So, as a bit of a background to the, to the human medicines regulations, uh, they, they apply UK wide, and our minister uh, is a co-signatory for any amendments to the to the regulations alongside the. Secretary of State for Health. Uh, the human medicines regulations really that the primary statute which controls and regulates medicinal products or medicines throughout the UK. So the regulations place controls on authorizations, manufacture, import, sales, supply, administration, etc. etc. So basically anything you wanted to know about uh, and anything you probably never wanted to know about the regulation of human medicines is found in uh, as the name suggests, the human medicines regulations. So within the, the regulations, it, it sets up the, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. So the MHRA is the body which acts as a licensing authority across the whole of the UK. Many of these proposals are proposed amendments related to the work uh, of the MHRA. <clears throat> the, the primary policy intent for these amendments or proposals is to support the effective and rapid rollout of a, a flu vaccine and potentially COVID vaccination programme. And they're really broken down into five main policy areas, and uh, I'll go through each with a bit of background, uh, if members wish. Yes, I think members would like. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> in, in no particular order, the, the the first amendment relates to the to the temporary authorization of vaccines. So, as they stand at present, the the, 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 medicine, the human medicines regulations already allow the MHRA as a licensing authority to issue a temporary authorization or temporary license to permit the use of an unlicensed medicine uh, in response to certain specific threats to public health, such as a pandemic uh, like COVID-19. So the, the proposed amendment uh, will make it explicit that the sale or supply or administration of uh, any product which could be temporarily authorized under, under these regulations uh, may be subject to additional conditions which the MHRA would impose. So such conditions would, you know, are likely to be similar to uh, conditions which are attached to licensed medicines, uh, things such as you know what st what storage conditions they have to be kept in, who they, who can be who they can be used on, uh, batch testing or quality assurance standards. So, <clears throat> pardon me, all additional safeguards 
Uh, and if any of these areas are not met, then the product would not obtain a temporary authorization, or indeed if there were breached, it would lose uh, its authorization. But it really should, should be noted by members that the, the provisions already exist to permit the supply of an unlicensed medicine in public health emergencies uh, when a licensed product is not available. These proposals simply strengthen those regulations and, and raise the standards by allowing the MHRA to impose you know, any additional conditions uh, would say feel appropriate. So the provisions and the temporary authorization would only be used by an exception and on a temporary basis pending uh, the issuance or granting of a license or full market, marketing authorization and you know, no vaccine or no COVID vaccine would be used or deployed until it's demonstrated you know, safety, quality and efficacy uh, through you know, robust clinical trials uh, that the MHRA would, would approve and uh, uh, would have enough evidence to support its use. Okay. Uh, the second proposal is really to bolster and expand the, the workforce uh, eligible to administer vaccines. So currently, uh, under the Human Medicines Regulations, uh, only appropriate practitioners are permitted, save a few exemptions, uh, to administer vaccines because they're parent usually parenterally administered, that is, by injection. Uh, appropriate practitioners are defined by the regulations and include doctors, dentists, pharmacists, prescribers, nurse prescribers, and some other independent prescribers. Uh, these proposals uh, would aim to increase the number of persons able to administer both flu and potentially COVID vaccines. Uh, this, this will be done in three ways, the proposals uh, for th three mechanisms. So the first is a national protocol, which will allow uh, registered healthcare professionals who aren't or who don't usually uh, administer vaccines allow them to do that, to do so, and people who are not registered healthcare professionals to administer uh, licensed or temporarily authorised vaccines. Uh, protocol would you know, set out who's allowed to do it and under what conditions and uh, what clinical considerations that would need to be followed, uh, and there would be Northern Ireland input uh, into any such protocol. Uh, all staff that would be issuing such vaccines under a protocol would either would usually administer would be health professionals who administer medicines as part of their work uh, or non-health, uh, non-healthcare professionals, but the, everyone would undergo a comprehensive training program and competency, competency assessment to ensure that they, they are suitable and able to uh, administer vaccines under the supervision of another healthcare professional. And the second proposal relating to the workforce is the expansion uh, of who can lawfully administer vaccines under occupational health schemes. Uh, at present, uh, only nurses are, are eligible or lawfully entitled to administer vaccines under occupational health schemes. Um, it's proposed to expand this workforce to, uh, to include other uh, healthcare professionals who would, would routinely administer medicines, such as midwives, paramedics, physios, pharmacists, and others, uh, to allow them to uh, administer you know, vaccines under occupational health schemes. Um, the, last, uh, the, the last proposal under the workforce arrangements relates to patient group directions, or PGDs. So PGD is a method uh, already contained within the human medicines regulations which allows for the sale, supply, or administration of prescription-only medicines, such as vaccines, without the need for a prescription. So PGDs are used in a variety of settings, you know, including community pharmacies and others, where they already administer uh, flu vaccines and or other vaccines, such as travel vaccines. Uh, a current restriction within the regulations uh, prohibits uh, medicines or vaccines without a full market marketing authorization from the MHRA to be used. This, this proposal will allow uh, vaccines which have been temporarily authorised uh, to be included within PGDs. And so it, it will enable the, the cohort of professionals who already administer vaccines under PGDs to deliver uh, vaccines that have been temporarily authorised. So on the whole, you know, really, proposals will ensure that workforce compromises enough people who are suitably trained to administer you know, the additional vaccines and uh, help deal with additional de demand. Uh, the third proposal relates to is really a clarification on civil liability related to vaccines. 
So human medicines regulations already offer protection from civil liability uh, to manufacturers or healthcare professionals who are asked to supply an unlicensed medicine in response to a public health threat. This is part of EU legislation which has been transposed. Uh, the, the, these proposals within these amendments uh, are to extend that civil immunity to companies or uh, drug companies who place the, the medicine on the market uh, in recognition that the, the, the company that actually markets or places the vaccine on the market isn't necessarily the manufacturer. Uh, so it balances that up somewhat. Uh, and the proposal also extends uh, the, the protection to non-health professionals who might be asked to administer a vaccine, you know, in line with the previously mentioned national protocol. So it, it, essentially it puts the companies uh, marketing a, a, a temporarily authorised product in no better or no worse position than they would be if the product was licensed. And it also put, puts uh, non-healthcare professionals who are asked to uh, administer vaccines on a similar footing or the same footing uh, as health professionals who would be administering uh, a vaccine. So any, any civil immunity would be forfeited if there are breaches in any of the conditions set out by the government. Uh, and any, any of the breaches would be uh, similar to uh, breaches of uh, the supply or administration of a licensed product and would be subject to the same standard penalties uh, currently set out in the regulations. Uh, the, the fourth proposal relates to wholesale dealing. It's, in simplest terms, wholesale dealing is a sale or supply of medicines between different entities, persons, or companies. Uh, currently, only companies or persons can uh, only wholesale uh, only wholesale deal medicines if they have a wholesale dealer's license issued by the MHRA. So these proposals will permit the, the wholesale supply of vaccines uh, by persons or companies or entities who do not have a currently have a, a MHRA wholesale dealer's license. So there are, there are already situations that arise uh, during public vaccination campaigns where there may be an excess of, of a particular vaccine in one healthcare organization, such as one trust, and two few vaccine, vaccines in another uh, trust, for example. So if, if a, for example, if a trust didn't have a wholesale dealer's license, uh, it would really have probably two options. The first one would be to destroy the stock that they, they no demand for, or they could uh, ask their wholesaler who has supplied the vaccine to them to come to return and uplift the excess stock, which would then have to be brought back to the, the wholesaler's warehouse and counted kind of and verify that it's it's still available to be used. And then that, that uh, stock could potentially be resent out to another trust, as an example. So this amendment really bypasses that step and allows a, a direct transfer between trusts or other uh, healthcare entities. Uh, if needed, so the vaccines could be uh, supplied or transferred in a, in a more efficient and timely manner. So th th these measures, the wholesale dealing measures, would be uh, time limited and subject to review. Uh, in first of year by li limited until first of April twenty twenty two, uh, where you know, a fuller consideration of whether this is a, a permanent, this should be made permanent. So. The last proposal relates to advertising, uh, and it's really to relax some of the restrictions on advertising, uh, the advertising of vaccines and unlicensed medicines. So we've quite strict controls on advertising of medicines, uh, and generally a blanket uh, restriction on the advertisement of unlicensed medicines. So vaccines can be promoted as part of a public health campaign to assist you know, the uptake rate for obvious reasons. Uh, these proposals uh, put simply allow the advertisement of a temporarily authorised vaccine uh, to ensure they can be included in any, any public awareness and, and uh, advertising campaign. And without these, the government and others couldn't uh, couldn't advertise uh, the, the, any temporarily authorised vaccine. So, really, in conclusion, the, pro the proposals you know put simply expand the workforce. To, Workforce who are able to administer vaccines in a variety of ways, permit the advertising of vaccines uh, to aid in the public awareness, and they allow for the wholesale supply of vaccines. 
you know, all of which will ensure that the public are aware of the vaccines, that there are enough people, uh, enough trained people to administer the vaccines to meet any anticipated demand, and that the, there is a stock of vaccines are located for and when they can be utilised. The other amendments simply clarify and strengthen regulations which, all, which already exist. Um, the, there was a three-week consultation, as you, as you mentioned, Chair, and it closed on, on Friday past, the 18th of September. Uh, the committee has asked for specific feedback, and we are working with DHSC, who led the consultation, to obtain uh, consultation outcomes with a specific reference to, to Northern Ireland. And the committee will be, will be provided with a, 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 an additional paper uh, on that. Uh, following that, um, uh, we would anticipate receiving uh, a further draft statutory instrument for our consideration. Uh, we will liaise with DSO um, and pair, uh, assuming the proposals are implemented without any substantive changes following the consultation. Uh, the, the amendments will likely come into force at some date in October, which is yet to be determined. And again, we, we would update the, the committee uh, when that date was or when the, when the regulations were laid, of course. Well, thank you. That's the end of, of my brief. And I'm happy, obviously, for any questions. And hopefully, Jared and, and Marty can join in with their expertise where appropriate. Okay, thank you, Kenneth, and, and certainly that has that has improved my understanding of the uh, of the proposed amendments. I have to say, um, first of all, from me, you, and you have elaborated to some degree on the issue of immunity from civil liability and uh, for manufacturers and marketing uh, organisations and and indeed health professionals or non health professionals who are administering. So. Um, if someone should become seriously ill as a result of being vaccinated, where would the liability then lie? Marty, do you want to come in on that one, or is that something? Yeah. You want to My understanding is that the COVID nineteen uh, disease has now been added to the vaccine dummies liability scheme. This means then that it's not, it's not a compensation scheme, but there would be liability if it was proven or suspected that it resulted in the vaccine. That the person would be entitled to uh, uh, funding from from that particular scheme. So that that's been put in place across the UK. That applies to, to all four administrations. Okay. In terms of where the person would go beyond that, um, I, I think it would probably be with the government as opposed to the, the manufacturer. Okay, and and you have you have said your understanding and probably and and I just I suppose could we get some clarity on that particular issue? In, in, in yeah, I heard it verbally at a meeting, but I, I can follow that up and get it in writing from them. Yeah, I think that I think that would be important. The other thing is that, as we understand it, the amendments are to allow for a temporary authorization for an unlicensed vaccine. So, can you talk us through the rationale for the rationale for that, the risks attached to that, and the mis the mitigations that have been considered to uh, to mitigate potential impacts of that? Uh, back to Canis there, is it? Or Canis, do you want to bring in some of the other gentlemen? Or, or did you want to fill that one? Or? Um, sorry, can, can you just repeat the question again? Yeah, so so in, 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 in undertaking this exercise, first of all, what's, what's the overarching rationale for doing it? What are the risks to doing it in this way? And, and what mitigations are in place around those risks? Right. Well, the, the rationale behind it is obviously the... Uh, to try to get the vaccine in, in, in place as quickly as possible. Now, it's important to point out that if it was unlicensed, it certainly wouldn't be untested. It would have to go through all of the, the normal rigorous process uh, and would have to pass all of those tests as normal before it, it was ever used in, in any member of the public. So it was purely just a timing issue. The actual process of getting the license does take a considerable length of time uh, and the balance would have to be weighed up in terms of a vaccine possibly being available that could be given to people in order to protect them against COVID-19, as opposed to not actually having the paperwork with it to make it uh, uh, licensed. Um, so that would be the, the 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 decision. That would actually be it would be the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation who would make that decision. It wouldn't be ourselves in, in Belfast or in London or, or Edinburgh. Uh, the JCVI is a, a UK-wide body of, of experts. That would weigh up all the the information, all the scientific information that they're they're privy to, and they would make that decision as to 
how effective the vaccine appears to be, uh, when it could be available from the, the actual amount that could be available. And then they would decide um, if they could go ahead and uh, under certain circumstances, to use a non-licensed vaccine uh, at that stage. And, and obviously then the, uh, the, the risk would be, you know, we, we have a vaccine available that isn't licensed and people continue to get COVID-19 and, and possibly, uh, you know, suffer the, the consequences of it as opposed to having a vaccine that could be used for a certain period of time while the license process goes through. But again, just to emphasize that the, the actual testing of the vaccine would be exactly the same as normal. It would have passed all of the tests that wouldn't be untested vaccine. It would just be unlicensed. And, and would there potentially be like additional maybe population level screening or individual screening to ensure it's that part of the normal process anyway that that these vaccines would be that they will be tracked and sort of you know uh, the either either their, their their effectiveness or any potential issues does that continue to be assessed? I think I think I think, I think Marty's really had the nail in the head in, in saying that you know, unlicensed doesn't mean untested. You know, and any any vaccine would would only be deployed after it's demonstrated you know, safety, quality, and efficacy. You know, through a robust clinical uh, trial program. But uh, with any medicine, there's sort of post marketing and ongoing pharmacovigilance to ensure that it you know, remains safe and that it remains effective and safe to use. That's, that's that's helpful. Okay, I'm going to go across to members then. I'm going to Paula, Pam, Alex, and Jerry at this point. Um, thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. I have a few um, quick questions. The first one really would relate to the concern amongst the more vulnerable uh, members of society in terms of this vaccine, those people who live with multiple morbidities, in terms of. Um, so, I'm looking for a bit of a readout from you in terms of. Um, I think you used pharma control or something there, um, Canis, but it was really about how these the vaccine will be tested if they're. Um, taking other medicine at the minute and, and how much, how rigorous is that process? Because obviously they're coming through this pandemic and already very fearful of, of maybe getting the vaccine. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure I can fully answer it, uh, Paula, but uh, you know, any testing by MHRA will, you know, you know, will take into account comorbidities and, um, uh, people using me other med medications and medicines, you know, that's part of the, of the routine uh, testing and clinical trial um, process. Okay, well, I, I think the, the point I'm thinking of making is, you know, it was a very quick consultation process, three weeks, and obviously there's this race around the world to get the vaccine out as soon as possible. And I suppose people are fearful when things are, are seem to be rushed through. Um, and suppose there's a bit of a communications issue for the Department of Health there in terms of reassuring people that you know the extent to which there have, have has been that rigorous testing and and um, so i suppose that just leaves that with you around the communication going forward um in terms of that three-week consultation what prior engagement have you had with the dhs um sc in in the lead up to this and who and what groups in northern ireland did you consult with and engage with before you made your official doh submission to this consultation process thank you We, the officials have ongoing engagement, you know, weekly, if not uh, more, or if not more frequent, uh, with the DHC official, DHSC officials, on a number of uh, areas of legislation and, and the SIs that the committee is partly aware of and aware of uh, through the exit and other matters and ongoing uh, health matters. So we've, I say, at least weekly engagement. In terms of the stakeholders, you know, we have a, a set of, you know, um, standard organisations and uh, bodies that we uh, include in, in any consultation. So, a patient client council, you know, community pharmacy and I, uh, BMA and I, uh, and similar groups. Okay, so, so you're confirming that you engaged with them prior to making the formal submission under this consultation exercise? No, we, we don't make formal consultation responses. In, the, in the, um, the minister's letter there to committee, he talked about the, the um, engaging around it. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find it here now, but I just thought that um, 
I had, I had read it there a minute ago about DOH then um, providing a response to this consultation process. So I'll, I'll find it and I'll, I'll come back to you. Yeah, we'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. So I'll, I'll move on then. Uh, I'll move on, Candice, then to um, Pam. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you um, with you know, whether these amended 2012 regulations will they still apply in Northern Ireland after the transition period? Um, and will the changes instead be reflected in the forthcoming medicines and medical devices bill? That was my first question. And the, the second one is uh, whether the department and the government, are, will they be fighting to ensure that the impact of the NI protocol is not one which causes a disjointed approach to Northern Ireland consumers receiving doses of the vaccine as part of a national coordinated effort? In terms of the, the transition period, yes, uh, these amendments and, and the human medicines regulation will apply post uh, the trans trans transition period. Almost get that out. Uh, the, the second query is around the, the medicines and medical devices bill. Could you just elaborate on that a bit, please? Uh, no, you, you, so you're saying that um, they will still apply after the transition period? Um, yeah, and I was so asking right. whether um, the changes would instead be reflected in the forthcoming medicines and devices bill, so that's not the case? No, no. The, 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 the bill will, if and when it becomes an act, will just give the department and DHSC a, a regulation making powers. So if, if we want it post the transition period, if we wanted uh, to make legislation, we would be making it under, um, the, if it becomes the Medical and Medical Devices Act. but. There's no bearing on this, uh, these proposals or these amendments. Okay. Uh, and then the, the second part was um, about whether the department and government are going to fight to ensure that the impact of the NI protocol isn't one that causes a disjointed approach to NI consumers receiving doses of vaccine as part of the national coordinated effort. Uh, I wouldn't be best placed to comment on it. I can't check with colleagues, but. You know, I would take that as a given that the department will be fighting to ensure that Northern Ireland uh, population have access, equal access to, to vaccines. Uh, I can confirm that has been discussed at a uh, UK wide vaccination uh, implementation board. It is, has been flagged up as a potential issue, and we have been in, in regular contact with the Department of Health and Social Care in England and Public Health England just to try to work out exactly what may be required and how we can mitigate for, for it under those circumstances. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to Paula then. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the confusion there. It was, really, it was the um, paper in our pack from Philip Bell at the Medicines Policy Branch, Department of Health, that was really around, um, he'd said about UK consultation legislation covering the whole of the UK. You will receive this consultation directly from the Department of Health and Social Care for comment as a key stakeholder of the Department of Health in Northern Ireland. And, I, and I, I'm just wondering, did the Department of Health here consolidate um, the responses from the stakeholders here, or did you encourage then individual groups that Canis had outlined earlier just to respond directly? No, they, they would be, have been asked to respond directly. Okay. But, but are you getting sight of, of, of the read, uh, a feed out, or sorry, a read out of, of um, what was fed in here from Northern Ireland? We're hoping to. Was, the, the consultation only closed on Friday, but yes, we, are, we have asked and we're hoping to get uh, a read out of that and specifically for ENI, but of the, the whole response. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Alex. Thank you. Um, except these have to be brought forward, um, but um, in terms of the campaign to promote the vaccine, there's quite a lot of scepticism from a certain quarter of the community um, because of scared of um, side effects or, or worse than that. Um, so it's going to be vital that that campaign um, is promoted well and everybody knows the consequences. Um, it doesn't help if you're doing a campaign that somebody could be using an unlicensed vaccine. And I know you're saying it's safe, but the fact that it's been declared as unlicensed, um, that's really not going to help sell it. 
<laughs> so um, that, that's something you, I think you need to think about. Um, and also in terms of um, when you're actually getting the vaccine, will everybody that gets the vaccine be told of any potential side effects before they actually take it as well? And that's my questions. Thank you. Well, did you want to comment on that one? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to say, obviously, uh, the fact that it might be an unlicensed vaccine, it, it has been considered, and, and there will be quite a bit of marketing and, and um, you know, promotion around that, just to emphasize that while it might be on uh, on license, it certainly will be untested, and to try to reassure people that you know um, that that's that's been considered, uh, and, and there's no concern with the actual vaccine. And in terms of the the next question, sorry, could you just repeat that one again for me? If um, there's a vaccine that you're using and it has known side effects, in some cases, not not necessarily everybody, but will it be made yeah. clear to everybody beforehand? Yeah, but my, my understanding is it'll be the same thing will apply as normal to any other vaccine. There's a there's a piece of information called the pill, which, which basically lists the sort of ingredients and possible side effects of any vaccine. And, and normally that would be given to an individual as they receive the vaccine. So certainly, and then the same sort of uh, procedures would also apply in terms of the vaccinator would obviously speak to the individual and record if, if they uh, felt, you know, if they felt dizzy afterwards or if they were sore arm or whatever, and that could be recorded and, and reported to the normal procedures. It's called the yellow card procedure, which would be uh, eventually work its way back to MHRA. They would gather and assess all of this, this information. So there would be uh, the, the normal procedures in place, but I think my understanding is MHRA are putting enhanced procedures in place to make sure that uh, any, any sort of uh, issue that arises is identified very quickly in terms of the, the possibility of there being, a, a, you know, a, a people who suffer additional sore arms or sore head or whatever, that that's identified very early on. That applies to all vaccines, but I think for this particular one, there would obviously be the extra cautions put in place or extra procedures put in place just to make sure that those are flagged up um, should they arise. Thank you. I'll go then quickly to Jerry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, kind of following some of Alex's points there, I mean, I'm not normally a fan of advertising, but I think advertising of the vaccine is going to be, uh, the, the benefits of the vaccine mm. will be essential. And I know it's not my job, but I, I was sort of friendly, in a friendly way, suggest that we can advertise it like the smallpox and other uh, diseases were eliminated by vaccines. I think that would be helpful to quell some of the, the nonsense out there. Um, but also, I think we're in a contradiction where we need, obviously, the vaccine quickly. Uh, but we don't want it uh, to be rushed in an unsafe way. Um, and I, I know some countries are sort of in a competitive way trying to rush it. So um, would you be convinced that um, everything is being done to make sure that the vaccine will be, uh, will be safe to administer to people? No, I think, just as I mentioned, Jerry, you know, no vaccine, no COVID-19 vaccine or any vaccine would be you know, authorised for use unless there is that ev evidence of safety, quality and efficacy coming from you know, the usual clinical trial routes. So you know, it, if it was, if there were questions around its safety or efficacy or quality, it, it wouldn't be given a temporary authorisation. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Quickly, quick question, question in terms of <clears throat> if there is a vaccine comes from somewhere like Russia, um, uh, would it be, uh, and it, there was a number of clinical trials carried out in Russia, would the UK uh, conduct any uh, trials itself to satisfy itself that the, that the vaccine was safe, or would they take it uh, that, uh, that, that the Russian um, tests were sufficient? The, the, the vaccine that the UK have signed up to it doesn't include the Russian vaccine. The, 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 the UK government have signed up to, I think it's six potential vaccines, over four different types of vaccines, um, which, which could possibly uh, deliver 340 million doses for the UK. And not all those vaccines will, will probably uh, come to, uh, you know, to pass all, all the tests or whatever. Um, but certainly none of them are the, are the Russian vaccine at this point. They're, they're all um, six companies that are, that are publicly known, but, but they're not the Russian vaccine. So my understanding is 
uh, at this point in time, we expect to, to use one of those particular vaccines uh, and we're, we're not looking elsewhere at this stage. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank the officials for briefing the meeting and for answering, answering the members' questions. And thank you for that. Okay. So we can let you go now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, mem members, any any uh, any any views or any issues in that in terms of any further action at this point in time? Or we we have we have obviously um, a commitment there that there will come in further information. I think we could reconsider then based upon that. Would members be content with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to move then fairly quickly because we are um, we are moving quickly to Nigel McMahon in relation to um, some of the other SRs. So do we have Nigel on the line yet? I don't think so. Okay, members. Uh, I just the next two SRs relate to um, restrictions and lockdown restrictions. I refer members to tabs 11 and 12 of the pack. I can advise members that a departmental official is here today to brief the committee on the regulations. So I'd like to welcome now by video conference Mr. Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer, and uh, no stranger to the committee at this stage. I might add. But Nigel, would you go ahead and, and give us a briefing on these two SRs, please? Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, I'll just give a quick briefing then and uh, then take some questions afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made and commenced on the 23rd of July. The Number 2 Regulations revoke and replace the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, including all of the previous amendments to those regulations. The regulations required to be reviewed every 28 days, with the first review taking place by the 21st of August 2020. The regulations are due to expire after six months, and that brings us to January 2021. Um, today, the committee is considering the number three and number four amendments to the restriction number two regulations. And just to remind the committee in terms of uh, the process around these regulations, uh, proposals for change are brought forward by various departments and considered under an agreed executive decision-making framework that includes guiding principles a risk-benefit assessment model, a structured process for assessing and implementing, modifying or withdrawing specific restrictions and requirements. And the decisions to introduce, withdraw, amend uh, existing regulations or requirements have been implemented through amendments to the regulations, directions, public messaging and guidance. <clears throat> so if the Chair is content, I'll just briefly summarise the two statutory rules and then I'd be happy to take any questions that the members may have. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, um, SR 2020, number 195, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number two, amendment number three regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The amendment number three regulations were made on the 11th of September and were commenced at 11 p.m. on the 13th of September. The regulations provided for the opening of soft play areas. SR 2020, number 198, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number two, amendment number four regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The amendment number four regulations were made on the 16th of September and came into operation with immediate effect. The regulations, which have become known as the local restrictions regulations, apply restrictions in a defined protected area. The restrictions are no mixing of households in private dwellings with some limited exemptions, and no more than six people from no more than two households to gather outdoors at a private dwelling, for example, in a private garden. The regulations introduce an emergency period 
during which local restrictions may be applied within a defined protected area. The emergency period can be ended by a direction made by the Health Minister. This direction can also be revoked by the Health Minister following consultation with the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Scientific Advisor or the Deputy Chief Medical Officers, effectively bringing the emergency period back into force again. The protected area is defined by means of postcodes, wards or council areas. The department must make a list itemising the postcodes, wards or council areas that constitute the protected area and publish this immediately online and subsequently in the Belfast Gazette. The original list of postcodes was published at the time the regulations were made. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland Protected Area Direction Number 1 2020 was made on Friday the 18th of September and added BT60 to the list from 5 p.m. that day. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland Protection, protected Area Direction Number 2 2020 was made on Monday the 21st of September and added all Northern Ireland postcodes to the list from 6 p.m. on Tuesday the 22nd of September 2020, effectively meaning that the local restrictions now apply across the whole of Northern Ireland. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to uh, try to uh, answer any questions that members may have. Okay, um, thank you, Nigel. So, what primary legislative power enables the department to issue directions? You, you have mentioned that this can be done via direction from the health minister or a number of other senior officials. So, what primary legislative power is that located within? Um, it's actually located within the, the regulations themselves, which are secondary legislation. So, the number the number four amendment regulations allow the department to to make those directions. Okay, but I do note that the Assembly has no democratic oversight of or input in respect of directions. Um, what, was, what was the rationale for using that approach to these particular um, restrictions? Okay. Um, I suppose I would point out that in the, in the original, from the beginning, in the original um, restrictions regulations, there was also a power to make directions in relation to um, uh, the enforcement of, of parts of the regulations. So we actually have had two, re two directions prior to this one, you might recall, which allowed councils to enforce the closure of premises to assist the police. And the second direction um, related to allowing um, tr transport service provider officials to enforce the face coverings uh, regulations on board public transport. So. It is a mechanism that has actually been used uh, previously in, in the original regulations. In this case, um, the rationale was effectively that we were reacting to a very rapidly changing situation in terms of the surge of the increase in the number of cases of the disease. Um, and we we're moving quickly, obviously, then to try to bring something in to um, allow additional restrictions to be put in place in those areas where um, the rise in the number of cases was causing the most um, concern to help to um, restrict or prevent or reduce the interaction between um, individuals and indeed between households, particularly in a domestic setting. So um, the regulations were brought in uh, quite quickly to begin with. And there was also a feeling that this was a very fast moving situation, which of course has proved to be the case. And so we needed a mechanism where we could change the area covered by the enhanced regulations quite quickly, both in terms of including areas where the numbers of cases were rising, but also to be able to remove areas as soon as possible, where the reduction in cases that we would hope to see would mean that they no longer needed um, to, to have those restrictions applied the same sort of principle we've applied all along of removing restrictions or requirements at the earliest possible opportunity um, just as soon as the evidence suggests that we can. On a practical level, we were also conscious that um, in bringing this amendment into the main regulations, 
if there were postcodes to be added in and taken out um, on a very regular basis, that without using a mechanism like directions, we would require a new set of regulations to do that in each case. Um, I think we've, it's true to say we've moved more quickly than any of us imagined that we would originally to effectively covering uh, the whole of the, um, the, the, the whole of Northern Ireland with this. And of course, that means then that we're now looking at a situation where we would hope over time, uh, if the measures have a positive effect, to be able to remove postcodes from the list rather than, than, than add them at this stage. But yes, on a practical level, it was really to, to um, avoid having to make an entire set of regulations and all that goes with that. Um, if we were potentially adding in, taking postcodes out, possibly as we thought, maybe numerous times um, uh, over a week, for example, depending on the change in the situation. So, uh, and all that goes with that, of course, in terms of uh, the, the committee having to um, consider in session, you know, uh, whether one or two postcodes were added in or taken out either there, and then an assembly debate associated with each of those as well. So it was both um, the ability to be able to respond very quickly, but also being very conscious of uh, uh, of the practicalities that changing the regulations each time would mean. Okay. Well, in in relation to in relation to the the previous use of them to use councils to do the enforcement, that was that was to just uh, to designate them as bodies for enforcement. It wasn't to give them the power to make or change regulations. Now, the committee has been quite flexible and, and has recognised fully the emergency nature at times. However, we do, at, at every given time, wish to apply the maximum scrutiny. And I don't think we actually, um, and we have facilitated additional meetings, and we would be, I think, happier to do that than to set and train something now that would cut us off from further scrutiny and would allow an official to just simply designate or not designate. So I am a bit concerned about that element of this, Nigel. I think I think potentially all the members are, but I'm, 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 I'll just I'll just open up there. I have Pam actually looking to come in yeah, first. Thank you, thank you, Nigel. Um, I suppose um, we've moved on now. Obviously, countrywide restrictions, the local restrictions have moved to to countrywide, and we understand that completely. Um, there was an awful lot of confusion when that was, um, you know, in terms of when the local restrictions initially came in. And then a short time later, seemingly by accident, people, we, we as um, uh, politicians and the media and the general public were learning uh, just by default that their postcodes were then included um, when they didn't expect to be included. And then there was an awful lot of debate then on, on whether that was, whether that had come to the executive, whether that had been agreed, not agreed. Uh, so I think that's regrettable i think something is um something as important as that and in terms of communication and getting that wider public message out it should have been my opinion is it should have been announced um i just wonder you know where are we with that was was the executive I mean, my understanding is the executive was not aware of the changes um maybe you could confirm or, or deny that and then i wanted to ask you a couple of questions in the round um the exemption covering caring responsibilities for childcare, um, whether that, you know, if you've got more than one set of grandparents, for example, that are um, caring for a child on different days, does that exemption um, apply to both sets? And I also want to tag on a question of, of um, caring responsibility, even in terms of animals, pets, uh, you know, those people who maybe go and walk somebody's pet while the other person's at work. That type of thing. Does that include that? And finally, the last wee bit I wanted to ask was around um, weddings and domestic settings, whether um, gardens are still permitted subject to the proper risk assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just very briefly jump back to uh, the Chair's last comment about scrutiny, just something I'd like to clarify, if I, if I, if I may. Um, I think the chair, you know, referred to um, officials making designations. I just want to clarify that um, th this was an amendment to the main set of regulations. So the the local restrictions are now part, if you like, of the overall package in the main regulations. And um, in terms of the process for any amendments or changes, that is no different to the process for the for any other amendment. That is to say, 
any proposals for changes, in this case coming from the Department of Health to change postcodes, uh, whilst the Health Minister ultimately has the power to um, to make a direction, just as he, as he has the, the power to change the regulations. Those proposals go to the uh, executive and they're discussed and agreed, so there'll be no no changes to the um, the scope or the application or the geographical coverage of the local restrictions without executive discussion and agreement. I do take the point about um, because it's a direction and not an SR not coming to the committee in this way. Um, I'm more than happy to work with the committee. I mean, the, the, as, as I said in my introduction, the information is published immediately online and is available online, but more than happy to work um, with, with, with the committee through the the clerk or whatever mechanism is appropriate to come up with something where we can um, we can make sure that the committee is advised directly um, of any proposed um, or any change to, um, to to the list of the postcodes and the local restrictions. So I'm happy to take that offline and, and, um, and, and agree something on that. Um, I'm sorry to come back to your questions of the confusion at the beginning. In terms of the executive, obviously, I, I, I'm not in a position to say I'm not, I'm not aware of what was, was discussed and agreed, and there may or may not have been um, a difference of opinion about what was agreed on that. I would acknowledge that the uh, communications was, was far from perfect. We don't get it right um, all the time. I think, um, from my perspective, I think where the problem arose was in communicating the decision initially and in trying to use the sort of language that people might normally um, or, or might better understand rather than talking about particular postcodes. It, it's difficult when you're using phrases like Belfast or Greater Belfast or the town of Ballymena. Um, it, it might mean more to, to, to people in, in terms of their understanding, but the difficulty, I guess, for us uh, making the legislation is that those sorts of terms actually have little or no meaning in law. And our legal advice was that's why the regulations require that um, the legal definition of the area must be by way of postcodes, wards or council areas, because they are all defined legally. Um, our sense was that people may not know which ward they're actually in. They're much more likely to know which postcode they're in or which council area. But depending on where the rates are, of course, you know, some of the council areas might not necessarily um, match um, uh, the map, if you like, in terms of where the highest areas are. So um, we've gone for postcodes in this case, um, uh, but it's a, difficult, it's a difficult thing to communicate, a long list of postcodes. I think we ended up in the first list with 10,000 postcodes, um, covering 54 pages on the website. So it is a bit of a challenge to sort of communicate that uh, in terms of language that uh, where people fully understand, but I appreciate that. And, and initially, uh, I'm sure we didn't get that right. We did work with Ordnance Survey, and you may have seen as an interactive map um, online that shows the areas. This doesn't have any legal standing as such, but was an attempt to try and clarify or assist people to go into that map to see where, whether they were included uh, or not. And hopefully, we'll we'll um, get better at this as as time time goes on. Um, could, I just, could I just indicate there that we are under some pr pressure for time? So uh, okay. um, maybe, maybe I'll suggest to members, I know just in light, of, in light of that concern around the issue of directions and in light of that Nigel has committed that he will uh, work with us to see what, I, I would maybe propose we defer that and maybe that will allow those questions to be deferred, that particular uh, SR to be deferred to next week and we can take further questions and maybe have more time on that. Would members be content? With that, we've indicated. I actually have to leave. Chair, I've got Bill of Rights at, at two. So, are, are, are you doing any more work in these? Yes, we, we have we have some more work to complete, which which I'll continue on with now. But I could maybe um, I could maybe we could we could go back to the soft play SR, and we can we can defer this one. Go back to the soft play. Um, and if there's any other questions for Nigel on the soft play only, can we, I get we, most I, of my other questions on the? Yeah, line? could could we could you just oh, as quickly as possible on Pam's other questions about cures? Um, Nigel, please. Yes, in terms of um, childcare, although we're talking about the number four amendment regulations today, number five amendment regulations that came in this week um, expanded or clarified the issue of childcare to, to so that any informal childcare would be included as an, as an exemption. Um, 
pets isn't something that's specifically been raised with me so far, but there is an exemption for things like supported living arrangements and for people who, who are vulnerable. So people who uh, have, have pets that, that, that where they're not able to take them out themselves, I imagine that may well be covered by that. Something we maybe need to think about a bit, a bit more. Um, weddings uh, in gardens. Currently, I, I believe that if you're talking about a wedding in a large garden, then um, the six from two would still apply in that scenario. So I suppose the best advice would be um, not to hold your wedding uh, in your garden, and, and given the current local um, restrictions that, that are that are in place. Um, outside of your private uh, garden, then then the normal restrictions would apply. So uh, the risk assessments, more than 15 people at the venue, all of that, uh, as was the case before, would still continue to apply. So it's very brief, but I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and quick, Paula then? Just a quick one, because I have to leave. Um, I've got some um, correspondence from constituents that it's taking up to a week for the contact tracing unit to contact them and then maybe their memories fading a little bit around who they've been in contact with and where they've been uh, before their sort of symptoms started to appear. I'm just wondering if you're going to come back to committee, could you sort of give us some indication of the interplay between what information you're getting from the contact tracing unit and then how that's then influencing the, these restrictions um, and, and your deliberations around them? Do you want me to say something on that now? No, for next, for next week, Nigel, please, if you just give that some consideration. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, so listen, Nigel, we are going to need to see you next week again. Thank you for coming along today, and we will uh, we'll, we'll give further consideration to 195, but thank you for attending today. Thank you. Thank you. So, members, we, we, we have agreed to defer SR 2020-198. Um, SR 2020-195 is the soft play area. Um, the exact, the, the, it removes soft play areas from business services and premises subject to closure. The examiner of statutory rules has reported on this SR and has no comment to make. The SR is subject to the confirmatory procedure. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? And if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 195, the health protection, coronavirus restrictions, Number two, amendment number three, regulations, NA 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, uh, moving on then. We have an additional item today, and that's in relation to the food and feed safety and hygiene miscellaneous amendments, EU exit regulations 2020. So, can I advise members that the Food Standards Agency has advised this is a UK statutory instrument and that it will ensure that retained EU law on food and animal feed safety and hygiene will apply to Britain rather than uh, applying in the north here, in accordance with the protocol on Ireland and the north of Ireland. It reflects further EU legislation relating to food and animal feed safety and hygiene, which has come into force since the FSA's 17 EU exit SIs were made in 2019, and it revoked certain other EU exit reg regulations to ensure legal operability of the NA domestic food and feed safety and hygiene legislation at the end of the transition period. The FSA has further advised that six -week consultation, a six-week consultation was held. The consultation received seven responses, and all respondents either agreed with the proposal or recognised that the approach taken in relation to the SA was necessary. An official from the FSA is available should members have any issues they wish to raise in regard to the SA. So have members any issues to raise with this statutory instrument? Are members content to note? Ten. Ten to note. Okay, thank you, members. So, moving on then to the forward work programme, item 13. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 13.1? I can now advise members that the Minister has offered to brief the committee next Thursday morning, the 1st of October, at 9.30 am. Are members content with that? Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Just a uh, general uh, clarification, Chair, on, um, I don't think it's in this week's or in the 
in the paper. But in regards to, I think we're getting Judith Gillespie in in a, in a few months or a few weeks' time, in regards to the, the, the car home and the Magdalene, um, the baby, mother uh, baby. Uh, mother baby car home, excuse me. Um, I know we, we, we wrote to one of the people who uh, contacted the committee, I think, last week, um, looking for, I think, a, a written uh, briefing. Um, but are we, just a clarification, are we uh, making space for some of those people to speak to the committee in a in a closed session or, or a, a, um, some kind of session. So just a clarification, I can remember and recall what, what we, we agreed on that. Yeah, well, at, at, the, at the outset, I, I, was, I was saying that I think it will be important that we make some space for that. We will need to look at how we arrange that within the Assembly. Members will also need to consider how they manage that among, along their, their, their other uh, workload. But we will certainly, I think there are certain, there are certain things there that, that have been either uh, have been in the process for a long time, and a lot of people are left in a very uncertain position, or that there's a, a timeliness to the to the issue that we will need to bring forward. So I think we need to very carefully look at what it is, and that that's one issue that I think is 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 something that will be important, and we can perhaps get a bit more discussion on that in relation to our strategic yeah. work next week. Yeah. But yes, that's Thanks. so. Members content for the for the minister. Thank you. Secondly, the department has confirmed there is no urgent need to take the SA the, the UK SA next week. As indicated on the programme, so this will get, that could be rescheduled as required to make a bit of space. Are members content to note the forward work programme subject to the, those two amendments and our decision to reconsider the SRs that we've just discussed there? That we include them in next week's meeting. Okay. So also on the forward work programme, members will note the suggestion that we seek additional international academic input on the 15th of October to inform our inquiry. A number of names are listed. But can I ask members, would members be content that we check the, the availability of other academics cited in the raised paper? There was a number of other academics within the raised paper that we have considered. Are members content that we approach some of them just to, just to form a panel of experts that would be of use? Okay, thank you. Members are content with that. Any other business then? Do members have any other business? Sure. Just on the, uh, the 9th of July, the committee uh, discussed uh, the events of, of Mr Storey's funeral. Um, and it was a committee decision taken to, I think, write to the um, Commissioner of Standards, or the Standards Commissioner, um, to ask him to uh, conduct or her to conduct a, an investigation into it. Um, would it be possible to for the clerk to circulate that letter to the committee? Yep, sure. Yep. So members content with that? Yep. Thank you. And Pat, were you indicating there? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, it's just in relation to the Billy Caldwell case, I mean, most of the members will be familiar with Billy's case and uh, probably most have met his mother, Charlotte, uh, who's a very feisty and determined woman who, who wants uh, the best for her son, as most mothers do. Now, the minister made an announcement, a public announcement, a couple of weeks ago, which, which appeared to be a resolution to this particular case. However, uh, Charlotte has communicated, and I think she's communicated with everyone on the Health Committee, that she hasn't yet received any communication from the department, and there's still no care plan in place for Billy. Now, as I say, uh, Charlotte's a very upbeat woman, but the last few emails I have received from her over the past week have been very despondent, uh, and she's very, very concerned about Billy's future. It's also been the case that social services have been called into this case to try and remove Billy from Charlotte. Uh, and, uh, you know, she is of the belief that there's something underhand going on. And I just wonder, could the committee write to the minister as a matter of urgency and ask him to clarify uh, what the situation is, uh, to ask someone from the department to communicate directly with Charlotte and outline what process is going to take place in order that a care plan for Billy be put in place? Well, the committee have taken a view on previous occasions that we cannot get involved in individual cases. However, there are wider implications around the case that, that Charlotte has made with Billy. And I know we have previously written to the minister in relation to that. Um, I'm also conscious the minister is here next Thursday, and I think it, it would be certainly an issue that could be raised there. As far as as far as writing to seek clarity in terms of engagement, I don't think there's any issue with that. But I do I do want to I do want to to uh, just reiterate that that the committee cannot, in fairness to all to all people, cannot take on individual cases in that sense. But I think we could flag up that there are 
There are ongoing concerns around the availability, the continuity of availability of medication and how these cases are being handled because they appear to be getting kind of um, very not not specific, but that, that the treatment is, is is changes and that the systems in place are not very reactive to to the needs of children or or parents in in this situation. So would uh, would members be content that, that we raise with the minister and we we flag up in a general sense that there are issues continuing with with the uh, with CBD. I think the advice, Chairman, that you're given is is, is good advice in, in the sense that there's so many people out there looking for care packages and, and, and everything else. And I think if we do single one out, uh, one that we're particularly we're all very, very sympathetic uh, to, and we hope that there is a resolution. But I think as a committee, it would be putting ourselves in the, an upward position. But I don't. Th I think the course of action you're, you're suggesting next week with the minister, I think an individual member of the committee asking the question uh, is, is quite fair. And, uh, can I come back in there, Chair, please? Yeah, well, just before you do, Pat, I was going to say individual members have previously agreed that they will engage with Charlotte uh, as, as, as and when. So go ahead, Pat, and we're, we're under some pressure for time. I need to get Jerry as well, so go ahead, please. Two issues. I've mentioned this quickly just in relation to this case, and I, I understand the general principle of not dealing with individual cases, but the reason I raise it is because the Minister made a public announcement about that. So it's in the public domain and it has general ramifications. So I, I, I'd make that point. Secondly, just in, in a matter of, of, of uh, technicalities here today, during one of the breaks, I made a phone call. Before I left my computer, uh, the computer was on mute. On mute. Uh, now, apparently during my phone call, others in the room were able to hear me. Uh, so I presume it was unmuted from uh, your end there. Uh, so I'm I'm just wondering, could we have a some some sort of uh, uh, um, directions on paper as to when uh, the the computers will be muted and unmuted while people are using Starleaf? Thanks. Okay, we'll see. Can can we get just uh, just on a, I mean I'm only being pedantic here, but uh, on a technical point. Uh, we're advised not to use uh, uh, you know, our mobile devices. Uh, if I lifted the phone in here and made a phone call, the chair would, would call me the order. Uh, so if somebody's coming into the meeting on, on Zoom, uh, are, are they subject to the same advice uh, around mobile devices? So should you be making a phone call? Even if you're on Zoom, so, folks, I'm go folks, I, I'm going to have to park that up. You've, you've made your points. We are working our way through new technology. We will, we will do that if it's further guidance. But members do have a responsibility to to make sure that they are they are aware of all of that. Very, very quickly, yeah, Jerry. I don't want to weigh in the technological debate, Chair, but just I think it's the Charlotte Caldwell, Billy Caldwell cases in, in the public interest. So I think it is urgent that we forward that on. So that's my point. Okay, yeah, I appreciate Thank you, Pat man. bringing the, the Charlotte's case up. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm also I'm also conscious that I would not, as chair, want uh, individual details of cases to be aired in the public in such a public forum. So I, I do think we need to be very very careful in relation to that. Members, date, time, and place of the next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, the first of October, in the Senate Chamber at 9:30 a.m. When we'll have a briefing session with the minister, followed by a strategic planning session. Thank you. Twenty-nine.